It's September 21st, Tuesday morning. Good morning to you. A happy Tuesday, the day after the 44th federal election. We've got a great show coming up uh, in just a few moments. We'll connect with Sapria Duavetti and then on to uh, get the ball rolling. We, we've got a couple of uh, dust ups brewing on this morning's show. And of course, we're looking real talkers to see where you're perceiving the most significant storylines. This show is presented per usual, by our good friends at Bitcoin Well. They're Canada's first publicly traded Bitcoin ATM. If you have any questions on buying or selling Bitcoin, crypto, whether or not you should be investing or or saving in in Bitcoin or Ethereum or or Doge or, or, or something else, you want some real talk about crypto, Bitcoin Well is your place to go. Staffed by real live humans. They can answer your questions either on email, over the phone, or in person. Proudly headquartered in the same city we are, Edmonton, Alberta. Find them online under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. So what do you think? 600 plus million bucks for status quo. That's how I've seen essentially this election characterized, though you don't know it's going to go that way until you do it, do you? So was it worth it? That's the question that we'll be asking you this morning. We'll be looking to the live chat. And of course, you know, our hashtag Real Talk RJ is uh, is powered by the team at Park Power. So producer Sarah Hoyle's keeping an eye on that one. The big storylines, many of them still in play, of course, and, and depending on where you're joining us across the country, and we, we wish you a good morning or a good afternoon, depending on when you're downloading the show, the storyline may look different in, in, in Atlantic Canada versus Ontario, on the, on the prairies versus the West Coast. We, we're keeping an eye on some, some stories that are, that are still developing, including right here in the riding where we do this show, the riding where our studio is located, Edmonton Center, where it looks like it could go back to the Liberals after two years with Conservative James Cumming. Before that, the, the Liberal challenger Randy Boisneau was the MP and, and special advisor to the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on LGBTQ issues. So those two have been fighting it out. And, and at time of recording, when we're putting this show together, the numbers showed that Randy Boisneau was up by about 136 votes. But that can change. Mail-in ballots, uh, m- you know, almost... Uh, 70,000 of them, 68,000 mail-in ballots will be counted today across the country, many of them on the West Coast, which is kind of an interesting development. But, of course, that could have an impact on some ridings that are really, really tight. Down in Calgary, George Chahol, a city councilor, wins against the conservative incumbent, Jag Sahota. That's a big story. I saw Paul Ferry, a commentator at the University of Calgary, tweet yesterday, congratulations to George Chahal, minister of whatever he wants. George Chahal is going to be an important representative for the liberals, another minority government, obviously, uh, from his riding down in Calgary, uh, a liberal MP down in Calgary. That's a big deal for the governing liberals. Kerry Diod, a conservative MP, sent packing in the riding of Edmonton Griesbaugh by a, a rising hotshot candidate, Blake Desjardins, who ran an excellent campaign, leaving really no room, I don't think, for Diot to repeat. The, the People's Party of Canada may be factoring in in that riding and in several other ridings across the country, including Ontario. We're going to be talking to some of our political analysts and experts about the future of the PPC coming up you know, during this show, throughout this show. And of course, we're curious to know what you think as well. We'll bring you excerpts of most of the leaders' speeches last night. Obviously, a tough night for Anime Paul out of her riding of Toronto Center. She had hoped to win that one. She knew it was a liberal stronghold. Not only did she not win, finishing fourth in that riding, a really tough finish for the leader of the Greens. And of course, you have to assume that her leadership, her tenure, will be shortened by these election results if it wasn't going to be already. Just a a strange scenario with the Greens. We've talked about that a lot before on the show as well. Former Cabinet Minister Marianne Monsef is out. Former Cabinet Minister Bernadette Jordan is out. You remember Minister Monsef at the time, when she joined us here on Real Talk, was was Minister for Economic Rural Development, Rural Economic Development. Uh, She made that comment about the Taliban, our brothers. You have to wonder if maybe that's one of the reasons, maybe that's the reason why she was unable 
to repeat as the incumbent there. Bernadette Jordan, Minister of uh, Fisheries, and of course, uh, some real uh, conflict and controversy uh, in her riding, and th- that came home to roost. So say the analysts as the conservatives take that riding back from liberal Bernadette Jordan. Maxime Bernier, tough finish for him. Derek Sloan, tough finish for him. And so what does that mean for the right-wing social conservative movement in Canada? We'll ask our guests, including Sapria Devetti, in just a moment. Let's take a second to remind you that the team at Westworld Computers keeps our studio powered each and every morning. And they want to do the same for your home, your business. They've had that sale on that means new IMAX. New MacBook Pros, new iPad Pros all come with perks, including in some circumstances up to $100 in accessories. You can find more details online at westworld.ca or you can go see them in store. They've been independently and family owned for more than 40 years at westworld.ca. Also, big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. We know we're getting to the time of year where they're going to go into planning mode. They're going to start working with their clients to take dreams and turn them into reality. If you're in a position to maybe embrace next spring with a landscape project, have your dream outdoor space in place by summer, it's never too soon to get in touch with the team at Eden Landscaping. They've got plenty of referrals examples of their work the portfolio online you'll find them under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com well our first uh, guest our lead off guest a great friend of this show she's senior counsel at enterprise canada a visiting researcher at ryerson university you've seen her on cbc's power and politics she's a member of the real talk editorial board and it's a pleasure to welcome back hitting lead off for us this morning sapria Duvetti, thanks for making time for us. Good morning to you. What's what's the what's the top of mind story when you woke up this morning? What was the top story that you were thinking about? Honestly, that I felt a little hungover um, because <laughs> I'm old now and red wine just doesn't sit the way it used to. But the second very close thought that I had was, OK, let's see what some of the mail in ballots uh, will change. Right. Like we've seen in terms of the result, as far as the seat count goes, there's not a ton of difference. Um, I woke up to at least a, a few messages from those in the uh, liberal camp that seem to think they can uh, edge out another couple of seats. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it just means a, a stronger minority, but but still a, a minority at the end of the day. But I think what this really allows is for parliament to sort of function in a way that each, you know, whether you're the government or the opposition, you can't hold the the threat of a looming election over the other party in order to sort of stomp your feet and get your way. So I think this kind of forces everybody to work together, um, whether or not it's on something like, you know, mandating vaccines for the uh, domestic air and rail travel, whether it's talking about mandated vaccines for the, for the federally regulated civil service, or, you know, while we're, while we're talking about childcare, like I know that was a big thing here in Ontario where, um, you know, uh, the federal government was able to ink deals with eight provinces and territories, Ontario being the most popular populous province still not on board. Um, it seems that now the federal government has at least a bit of a, a you know, bargaining chip in, in, in their back pocket where they can say, well, look, we were reelected to do this. And, you know, I would imagine that particularly in a lot of the GTA, childcare was top of mind because it's just so friggin' expensive here. Got an interesting question here. We're going to jump all over the map today, obviously, Supri, and I don't, I don't have to invite you to take this wherever you want because that's part of the magic when we connect. Jillian <laughs> on the live chat, I mean, I mentioned that that Marian Monsef, uh losing her seat. I don't know if you're surprised. I was a little surprised at that. Obviously, she stepped in it with her Taliban brothers comment. I'll get your take on that. And then Bernadette Jordan as well, losing her seat. So two cabinet ministers on their way out. Otherwise, numbers really not moving a whole lot. So if you're those two former cabinet ministers this morning, probably feeling a little bit like, what the hell? Jillian says, I'm concerned about how many female cabinet ministers lost their seat, the two of them. She says it's happened a bit in past, too, with conservatives, and it makes me think that the bar is set higher for women. What do you make in that circumstance? Yeah, I think that's probably generally true, but I would just say for at least, uh, you know, Bernadette Jordan, um, there was, the writing was sort of on the wall that it was at least going to be a very, very tough fight. And, you know, with respect to Miriam Monsef, I think the Taliban comment certainly didn't help her. I think they were blown out of 
proportion, you know, for the most part. But I think we also have to acknowledge that the, you know, talk radio, post media, Canada proud crowd um, in, in, in conjunction with the rebel and some of those other uh, right wing outlets have been going pretty hard on her um, since she was elected and even, you know, engaging in what would arguably be classified as, as misinformation when it comes to trying to paint her in a negative light or that she was somehow duplicitous in painting her story as an Afghan refugee. Um, so I think that there was a lot going into uh, this election, you know, in terms of baggage that I don't think um, Maryam Ansef was ultimately able to win out over. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's also worth noting, and this is kind of like the interesting factoid or tidbit here, is that Peterborough, uh, once upon a time, was often considered like this weird bellwether riding, right? That if whatever uh, color it went, then so did the rest of the country. Well, not anymore. Um, so I don't know, you know, it's not really a, a, a big headline item, but it's just a neat little thing that I think election nerds are are going to be writing about and, and, and picking up on and, you know, what that means for for greater trends, I think, uh, around the country. Well, I think and I think that it's it's interesting when you point that out about Peterborough and, and, and you're right. I think it was it was, yeah, like 60 plus years. It's always voted uh, in the way that the government's gone and people read into that it's like sports fans that get all kind of nerdy on you know how a goalie does with the first shot on net or something like that someone hitting lead off in the lineup um there was another one of those in edmonton that i thought was really interesting and these are the ones the the stories i'm most interested by on on the mornings after an election in edmonton greasebaugh where where carrie diot uh wins handily off the top of my head don't have the numbers in front of i think last election 2019 i think he won by like thirteen thousand votes like he stomped his candidates losing uh, by more than a thousand votes to Blake Desjardins, the NDP candidate in that riding. That was another big, interesting story mm-hmm. that we were keeping an eye on there. Sapria, let's take a look. We're going to listen to some of the comments from party leaders last night, and, and that includes Justin Trudeau, who obviously returns with a mandate of sorts. By definition, he's got one, another minority government. This was Justin Trudeau late last night. You are sending us back to work with a clear mandate to get Canada through this pandemic and to the brighter days ahead. And my friends, that's exactly what we are ready to do. So that's Justin Trudeau. Uh, You know, I I was watching last night with somebody who said, what what sort of a vibe do you think he's going to have? Do you think it'll be celebratory? And I said, well, of course it'll be celebratory, but that doesn't mean he feels that way. How does Justin Trudeau feel this morning? Look, I think he's breathing a sigh of relief, right? I mean, I think a win is a win at the end of the day. Um, and I think if the liberals that are seem to think that they can flip another two seats once mail-in ballots are, are counted and they do increase their seat count, then arguably that's an even sort of, you know, more sizable win or I guess a more determinative win that they can sort of take home with them. But uh, yeah, like I, I would imagine that, you know, if you were talking to some of those senior liberals like eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, and we were, you know, talking to them from from the future, um, they may have thought a, a little differently uh, in terms of uh, calling the the election. But but I, I sort of stand by my initial comment that this kind of at least, you know, in terms of child care kind of moves it forward and it, it moves forward the notion of like a better functioning parliament, like a minority parliament doesn't mean a minority government at the end of the day. And I think that with so much and, you know, the, the government in terms of having it loom, you kind of have at least a little bit of a runway now to tackle some of the, the bigger issues that we, you know, really need to fucking get on. I'm glad that you said uh, that because I think what people like the average person today is is wondering who is this good for or is this good for me or not you know people will be saying this was a uh, you know 610 million dollars for the status quo you just get what you had before why did we do this what's the whole point so you, you mentioned child care and that's a huge one you know the liberals will need ndp support and the nds have enough seats to allow them to pass motions and to hold some power jagmeet singh the king maker as people are saying last night so who is this scenario good for 
I, I mean, I do think it's good for a large swath of Canadians. Um, and I, I am going to keep hammering home that, that childcare piece because I, you know, I'm from Quebec where we have the data where childcare being subsidized by the provincial government there has paid great dividends when it comes to women's participation in the labor force. And when it comes to, you know, just parental leave for, for men as well, um, it turns out if you offer it, guess what? Dudes will take it. Um, and it means better outcomes for children. And I think, you know, when we're talking about playing kig maker, uh, yeah, Jagmeet and the NDP, it's very clear that they support a lot of the policies that the liberals are going to put forward. But what this really does come down to is, I think, being across the table from a Ford or a Kenny, because they have, you know, and Alberta hasn't signed on either yet um, in terms of a child care deal, but they can no longer say, well, I don't know if you're going to be in power. Like, why, why would I sign a deal with you? Right. And so now I think we can at least cut the shit, you know, um, and get the, the provinces and the federal government to sort of sit down and, and hammer something out. We have been talking about this since forever. I, I commented, like somebody was like, oh, we've been talking about this since 1993. I was eight years old in 1993. I'm now a grown ass woman in the suburbs with my own kid. Like we, we have to get this done. And it's just ridiculous that, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, where women have been leaving the workforce in droves because they've been forced to, to you know, care for their kids, care for their elderly parents, um, et cetera, et cetera, that we wouldn't have placed this um, in, at a much higher you know, importance in the election narrative because it kind of sort of got lost um, in a lot of the kerfuffle of, well, why are we having an election anyway? Um, and then of course, you know, the PPC nutters who were sucking up a lot of oxygen by protesting hospitals. Eric's writing in, he says, you know, I was sitting in a restaurant and, and a, <laughs> a table full of retired old white guys were saying that $15 a day child care was garbage because they didn't have it when they were younger. That from Eric Linda Ray says, you know, it, it costs $15 per Canadian to hold this election to bring in $10 a day child care for Canadians, which is an interesting point to make. Let's get to uh, Aaron O'Toole last night. This I thought was an interesting, a, a key moment. I think it was significant, and there were a lot of things to get into. Sapria, we'll ask you to psychoanalyze that whole <laughs> concession speech last night because there was no concession whatsoever. But here's a portion. This is what I thought was a significant moment last night with Aaron O'Toole. Above all, we must continue to show Canadians that whether you're black, white, brown, or from any race or creed, whether you're LGBTQ, or straight, whether you are an Indigenous Canadian or came to Canada five weeks ago or five generations ago, que le français soit votre première ou deuxième langue, whether you're doing well or barely getting by, whether you worship on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, every day or not at all, you are an important part of Canada and you have a place in the Conservative Party of Canada. Okay, so that was Aaron O'Toole last night. Of note, this is maybe just a tiny little thing, but he's the one that said whether you worship on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or not at all, I noticed that Justin Trudeau said no matter who you pray to and didn't leave any comment for people that don't pray whatsoever. Kind of interesting, maybe a little bit different than what you might expect from the conservative versus liberal leader. Yeah, I'm looking for the tiny little nuanced details, but Aaron O'Toole, what's significant here, obviously, is that he's maintaining that that centrist or moderate perspective is what they need to keep inching toward government. What did you make of his speech last night? And um, clearly a guy that was trying to box out anyone that was going to stab him in the back. Um, it was interesting to me that a couple of days before the vote, you had Pierre Poliev was basically putting out videos, trying to bank phone numbers um, and emails. So that will certainly be interesting. I said yesterday, I can think of a few conservative party strategists off the top of my head who would be like chomping at the bit for another go at a leadership race. But I, I do think that having a more centrist party um, for the Conservatives is a better path for them to form government. The only issue I think that Mr. O'Toole had this time around is that he, him and his campaign team certainly made the decision to tack towards the center. I don't know if they let anybody else know, right? And I mean, it was very interesting to me that they kept a lot of their front bench in terms of the, the shadow cabinet or whatever the heck that they call themselves, the opposition critics, um, kind of muzzled. 
Um, and in the last few days of the campaign, uh, Mr. O'Toole wasn't really taking a ton of media questions either. That, that's not the strategy that you employ when you think you, your ideas are going to win the day. Um, and I think if you are a party activist uh, for the Conservative Party and you are more to the right, um, you're going to look at this centrist tack and go, well, what the heck did it get us? You know, they didn't really have any GTA pickups. It's true that they did pick up some seats in Atlantic Canada. And I think Mr. O'Toole and his team can take that back to caucus or, you know, party membership and say, look, you know, at least we've got this done. And, and I don't think it is good for the Conservative Party to be switching leaders every, you know, two years I or agree. so. You know, you need, yeah, exactly. So they need to get their footing as, as leader. And I think um, it would, it, I, I, look, I'm just interested to see if he's able to hold on, uh, but I don't expect them to take advice from me. If they were to take advice from me, it'd be like, stick with this guy, see what he can do. But I, I, I would think that there are at least, you know, a couple of other high profile conservatives that would be more than happy to take that uh, job off of Mr. O'Toole. Yeah, but you know what? Honestly, I, I wonder if, uh, you, you know, like Hannah's watching in live right now and, and she's like, I'll, I'll admit it. You know, he got me with that speech, says Hannah. I was watching and and uh, and I was kind of I mean, I, I know a lot of people are saying, well, Aaron O'Toole, this is not a concession speech and he's not showing class. And, you know, typically someone that loses an election will will concede and say that they've called the victor and that they've, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that is true to a certain degree, but also if you see that, you know, you're, you you made gains based on your personal strategy or your team's strategy, and that may very well be, I mean, obviously they want to achieve government, but if their strategy was to send a message loud and clear to Canadians that they're moving the party to the middle and they want to be the party for people that would have voted for progressive conservatives back in the day, then I think that last night's speech was pretty significant. I was actually, to be honest, really impressed with Aaron O'Toole's speech last night. Sure, but I mean, to that point, if you're going to move your party to the center, then when you're running for leader, you should arguably do that. For sure, and he didn't do that, right? And you so should I think arguably is, do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, and he and he very much did not do that. He ran as a true blue conservative. He, you know, denigrated Peter McKay any chance he could for being a red Tory. Um, and then, you know, it turns out there's a general election and basically him and his campaign team is like, well, all that shit we said back then. Yeah, none of that. None of that fucking matters now because now we're in a general. And again, if you're a regular Canadian voter, I don't think you're necessarily paying attention to the conservative conservative leadership race. But this is where they got into a lot of problems in their own platform. Right. When it came to guns, when it came to language on conscious rights, where a lot of, you know, reproductive uh, rights activists were like, well, why would you put conscious rights in there, particularly when we're talking about it on the backdrop here in Ontario of a very contentious legal battle in terms of the uh, medical assistance and dying debate. So there are a lot of unforced errors, I think, that Mr. O'Toole made. And without having any gains in the GTA to really show for it, um, I'm not sure that you're going to stave off some of the more, you know, chomping at the bit conservatives that I was referring to but that can want you to edge them out. Can you stop sweating uh, if you're Aaron O'Toole? Uh, can you stop sweating the right wing flank based on what the electorate said? I mean, you know, you, you'll talk. There will be some conservative candidates that will lose their riding or that will have been involved in nail biters because the PPC candidate, the People's Party candidate factored in, you know, in some ridings, you know, 800 or 1000 or 1200 votes. And, and that did factor in. But generally speaking, you know, Maxime Bernier gets absolutely smoked in his own riding. The People's Party remains at zero seats. Uh, if you're the conservative party, if you're Aaron O'Toole, can, can you stop sweating them based on last night? Or do you maybe say, hey, man, everyone's talking about them, you know, five, six, seven percent. That's not a joke. Yeah, I don't think it's a joke. And I think we need to learn, I think, from some of the mistakes that um, other countries have made when it comes to ignoring the very real undercurrent of nasty populism and authoritarianism that is still lingering. Um, and so, yeah, the PPC did not get any seats. They were able to increase their profile, however, with a lot of you know free media attention. And they also increased their overall vote share. Now, I know a lot of folks are saying that it's likely a blip because of 
of the pandemic and they were able to ride in on like anti, you know, mask, anti-vaccine sentiment, anti-lockdown sentiment. And that's all well and good. But I think we also have to acknowledge that there's a good chunk of PPC supporters that are also, you know, supporters of very unsavory things like white nationalism, um, you know, bordering on neo-Nazism. And so I think those types of things have to be uh, considered carefully in the media and in public commentary. Whether or not O'Toole needs to worry about them, I don't think so. But if I were O'Toole, I'd be worrying about the, you know, the craziness that already sort of exists within conservative caucus that he did a very good job of not bringing to the fore. I mean, we're talking, we talked a little bit about Pierre Polyev. Had they formed government, he likely would have been finance minister. I mean, he pushes conspiracy theories all the time, like the Great Reset and whether or not, you know, the prime minister is being controlled by George Soros. So like there's a, enough crazy within the conservative caucus that they need to deal with first before they actually can legitimately claim to be a centrist party. And it'll be really interesting to, to see which side wins. Yeah. Like what is dealing with that look like to you? Kicking them out of caucus or which I know they're not going to do. Yeah, right? exactly. But I think no it's way. having better. It's having better message control. I mean, what, like you can't have MPs that are saying to media that the liberals and progressives, you know, want to normalize sexual relations with children, which is what Cheryl Gallant said. Like these are actual actual things that conservatives have said that have won re-election and will continue to be a problem for the conservatives. And again, you know, this time around, they were able to keep a lot of uh, some of the more objectionable conservatives at bay, uh, you know, and I, I mean objectionable to like the general electorate. Um, but again, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that a second time around, particularly if they didn't necessarily get buy in um, to move to the center with the blessing of their party. Yeah, one, one interesting election result I, I was keeping an eye on uh, in, in my former home uh, during my university years in Cloverdale, Langley City, uh, where Tamara Jansen was a, a relatively popular uh, conservative member of parliament. You'll remember that she was one of those that, that spoke out. Uh, I, I don't know if she spoke out in favor of conversion therapy, but she spoke out against banning conversion therapy, which might as well be favoring conversion therapy as far as the average Canadian is concerned. And in typically a very conservative riding of Cloverdale Langley City, the liberal candidate, John Aldag, uh, knocking off the incumbent conservative Tamara Jansen uh, by about 1,200 votes. I thought that that was pretty significant. They'll talk about when you, you know, if, if you know the lower mainland, Fraser Valley in particular, you know, Langley, Aldergrove, Abbotsford, Chilliwack, that, that's the Bible belt of, of BC right there. So I thought that was a pretty significant result. And, and I wonder if that might be on the flip side, if Miriam Monsef paid the price for a comment or if, if at least that contributed to it. I have to assume that Tamara Jansen maybe uh, met the same maker in that context based on some of her comments. And maybe the, the voters in Cloverdale Langley City said that person's not going to represent us anymore. It's something that would catch my attention if I was a conservative strategist this morning. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, that's one out of how many MPs that voted in favor of not banning conversion therapy. Yeah. What was it, like 60 or so? MPs, yeah, there were a lot of them. Yeah, more than you'd yeah. like to see, to be honest. More than zero. So, you know, <laughs> there you have it. Uh, why, why don't we take a quick look? Uh, Sapria Devetti, our guest, if you're just joining us live streaming on Mixler this morning. Of course, we're live streaming on YouTube as well. And a big shout out to everybody who's downloading this podcast. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks for liking, subscribing and rating it. Jagmeet Singh last night. I mean, obviously, they, they would have loved to to bump up their seats to 40 or 50. I mean, you know, let alone 100 that they saw a number of years ago, but, but maybe not the gains they hope for. So what does it all mean? They're certainly not a non-factor. Here's the leader of the NDP. My friends, I want you to know that our fight will continue. We are never going to give up fighting for you and your families. As we have done in the pandemic, as we showed you in this campaign, we will continue to make sure you are first, your families are taken care of, that your needs are met. A lot of fighting, uh, the message. I mean, he used the word 15, 20 times in his speech last night. So if you're Jagmeet Singh or his team this morning, the dust is starting to settle. How do you analyze how last night went? If I'm an NDP activist, I'm chirping Jagmeet Singh. Like, he did really? not come up with anything. He's had two shots at it. Tom Mulcair was fired for way less, right? Um, didn't really increase his seat count. 
Uh, they weren't able to convert a lot of their digital strategy and a lot of their youth first strategy into actual votes. Um, and I, they can take, you know, being fourth place, I think, the, is, is the block currently ahead at, at, at third? I, I think last time I checked, they were. Yeah, they are right now. Morning. Yeah, the block's yeah, leading so right now by, by depending on whose tracker you're looking at, by the way, we noticed that the CBC and the Globe and Mail are, are off by about two seats uh, in a number of different party scenarios. But right now they have the block over the NDs by about eight seats. So like, do you, is, is that good news? We're still the fourth party? Like, I don't think so. I don't think that's a winning story. And I, and I, and I think, again, here, the NDP had an opportunity to make some gains within the GTA. They did not do it. Um, I, I don't really know what the argument is for Jagmeet to stay on right now. Uh, and unlike some of the other, you know, issues that we would have in, in some of the other parties with like, well, who, who would be leader? I, I mean, Matthew Green would be a very good leader for the NDP federally. I have no idea if he wants to run or not. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to see an NDP party federally that isn't necessarily putting as much stock in Quebec as they are into urban and suburban ridings more comprehensively across the country. But that, of course, takes a complete, you know, party strategy sort of rebuild from the ground up. But if you're Jagmeet Singh, like you're, you're, you're laying in bed staring at the ceiling last night and when you're finally able to to chill out and it's probably four o'clock in the morning and you're staring staring at the ceiling and you're going what do i have to do like he, he's on tiktok he's doing all the stuff he's doing yeah. the publicity stunts he's fly, he's he's doing all the photo ops he's 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 can i just be surface and shallow for a second but this is how it works he's good looking and he's uh popular and he's engaging and he's got a great smile and he has great fashion sense and he's got all the things and people are going to be sitting here like what jesperson doesn't think that policy matters but i'm talking about <laughs> i'm talking about getting out the vote and engaging canadians and growing enthusiasm and fundraising around your party and you think that he ticks a lot of boxes so if you're talking to him personally this morning he looks you in the eye and says where am i falling short like where, i don't get it what would you say to him i mean they didn't really have a very detailed plan this time around their platform was basically a reprint of their 2019 platform and if you're talking about something like climate change in particular you know, you can't you can't have your one line for the liberals be like, you bought a pipeline. And then when asked whether you're going to also cancel that pipeline, go, whoa, 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 whoa. We're going to have to look at that. <laughs> like, well, they're not, we're not going to say no to it. Right. And I mean, in terms of independent analysis of the uh, climate plans, the NDP was graded often worse than the conservative plan was. So I don't really know if they can really take a lot of that home with them as being a win. And, you know, not all of that is, of course, Jagmeet's fault, but at the end of the day, the leader wears the mistakes. And if you can't bring home a win for your team, it doesn't matter if you're ultimately filling the stands, you need to win and they're not winning. 100%. What's one final observation you made? I know that there's at least 338 observations that could be made. Uh, what's one we haven't talked about that you want to leave Real Talkers with this morning? I really wouldn't discount the PPC. Um, mm. And I think we should be mindful and careful of how we go about framing their narrative. I noticed in a lot of media coverage yesterday uh, there was this talk of them being a freedom party without also noting the more unsavory elements of the party, like having candidates that were, you know, going on white supremacist uh, podcasts or, or shows. And I think we need to be very mindful of how we talk about that going forward. Um, it, just because they have no seats does not mean that they will have no seats next time around. Um, and I, I think, you know, we can look to the U.S., of course, we can look to Brazil, we can look to India. There are a number of countries that we can look to where hate has been allowed to fester um, and we need to cauterize that wound uh, before it gets, you know, even more gross and infected. Supriya Devetti, always well said, bang on a great friend of this show, senior counsel at Enterprise Canada, visiting researcher at Ryerson University. You can catch her here uh, virtually on a monthly basis, I guess, though we don't plan it yeah. that way. We'd have you more often if you weren't so busy. <laughs> Supriya, you also see her on CBC's Power and Politics and other platforms across the country. Have a great rest of your day and, and thanks for joining us this morning. 
My pleasure, Ryan. Thanks. You bet. Max Fawcett, Ken Bosenkool coming up in just a moment. I'm going to pick up right where Sapria just left off. I want to lead off with these two talking about the PPC. So, Sam, we can get the Max Bernier, although some people are saying Max Dernier. Uh, my French is not great, uh, but I do understand the translation of Dernier to be last. Uh, Max Der- Maxime Dernier, uh, the, I didn't st- I'm just stealing that right off our live chat. That's not my joke. Uh, <laughs> and we'll get to more of your comments on this. You can always send us an email. Our, our live chat is churning this morning, which is great. If you want something just to sit there for our review to make sure that we have a chance to, to take it in, talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you'll find our email address. Uh, that's where you'll find our inbox, rather. And, of course, that's also where you can submit uh, trash talk coming up on Friday presented by Local Waste. We've been telling you about this amazing opportunity uh, coming up in Edmonton on the 25th and the 26th of September to check out Rugby Sevens. This is uh, potentially a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, The HSBC Canada Sevens coming to Commonwealth Stadium September 25th and 26th. It was supposed to go to the UK, but they had to make a last-minute pivot. And that means that Alberta's capital city gets to host this incredible festival-like sporting event. I mean, all of the fans in wild costumes waving their flags, having a blast. Seven players per side, seven-minute halves. It's not some big, arduous, four-hour experience canada sevens.com is where you can learn more about it now you want to know what are they doing to keep us safe at this event well you've got to provide proof of full vaccination or they'll have covid tests on site you've got to test negative in a rapid test masks will be required if you're not in your designated seat and of course single day ticket pass is now on sale that means that patrons can attend for as little as 60 dollars for a full day pass you can learn more again at canada sevens.com If you're going to be making your way out of town, we wanted to remind you that you can now fly nonstop from EIA, Edmonton International Airport, to Palm Springs beginning December 16th. If you're going to be heading out of town there or anywhere else, but by the end of 2022, yeah, like, you know, months and months and months and months from now, why not log on to JetSetParking.com and pre-book your parking for $8 a day using the promo code Real Talk. That's right, parking for $8 a day at Edmonton International Airport via pre booking at jetsetparking.com. They're locally owned and you'll love them. Comprehensive uh, post election coverage on today's Real Talk as we welcome our next guests, Max Fawcett, a familiar face to this audience, a columnist with National Observer, former editor of Vancouver Magazine, Alberta Oil Magazine. You've read his work in the Globe and Mail, McLean's, The Walrus, CBC, and his sub stack, no doubt. Ken Bosenkuhl is a former senior campaign advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, former chief of staff to B.C. Premier Christy Clark, one of the original authors of the so-called firewall letter back in 2001, making his Real Talk debut. It's great to have both of you here. Good morning to you. I want to get to some of the comments from uh, party leaders last night and, and your general uh, thoughts on on what played out. But, but Ken, why don't we start with you? Big picture, wide angle lens when you woke up this morning and started thinking about how it all played out last night, what was the first thought top of mind? I think every leader went back three months ago and said, where did I think I would end up? And uh, on that scale, I think Justin Trudeau lost and nobody won. And that's my, that's my sort of quick takeaway is that Justin Trudeau missed his expectations by way more than anyone else did, but no one else really won anything. So it's just, uh, yeah, Justin Trudeau lost, and nobody else won. Max, how about you? I appreciate that Ken has to polish this particular turd, but I, I don't see it that way at all. Um, you know, uh, Justin Trudeau gets a, a mandate for probably three years, maybe four years if he wants it, because, um, you know, the NDP is not going to want an election anytime soon, and Aaron O'Toole may have to face a leadership review uh, very shortly. So, you know, I think the big winners here, and, and we miss this sometimes when all we do is talk about partisanship, uh, the big winners are Canadians. You know, I, I went into this election nervous about losing $10 a day childcare. I went into this election nervous about losing the best climate plan in the Western world. And those are both uh, those are both locked in now. We're going to get the $10 a day childcare. We're going to get, uh, you know, more progress on climate change as we go into COP in November. Uh, we're not going to go backwards. And I think that's a big win. So, 
you know, setting aside the partisan stuff uh, for Canadians, for voters, they're the winners. Ken, is the way that it's all structured with the liberals, you know, wanting to pass anything, essentially being forced to cooperate and, and find coalitions of sorts. Is, is that good news for the electorate? I mean, how do you see it? I think that's what Canadians wanted. I think Max is right in that respect. I think Canadians are saying, look, we don't want any of you jokers having uh, full control over the agenda going forward. So you're going to have to work together and you have to figure out who you're going to work together with on various issues. And I, I expect the Liberals won't always be looking at the NDP. They may sometimes look at the bloc and they may sometimes even look at the Conservatives as they get their agenda, <clears throat> as they move their agenda forward. And I think that's what Canadians want. They don't want a single party with uh, with complete control. Uh, we we'll, we'll talk about the liberals and the conservatives and and to a certain degree the NDP is as well. But we don't always have to lead off with the biggest ones. I mean, Supriya Devetti and I just wrapped up talking about the PPC and, and Maxime Bernier. And I, I want to pick both your brains on this one. This is Max last night. None of the other parties will fight for your rights, and that's why today the People's Party has become Canada's. Only, only real opposition party in Ottawa. The only, the only party that's opposed to all this nonsense that is destroying our society, our economy, and our country. If we had a proportional voting system, we would have elected about 20 MPs today. Unfortunately, we won't be able to carry on this fight in Parliament, but we will continue this battle to unite Canadians under the freedom umbrella. Max, will they continue the battle? Does the PPC gain or lose momentum after last night? I think they lose momentum. You know, their rise is very much a, a result of COVID and, and, and the unique circumstances around that. So I think, you know, fingers crossed, as we get out of COVID and put it behind us, I think the appeal of a party like the PPC will fade. I, I appreciate him giving us a really good example of why proportional representation is a terrible idea. Uh, you know, as he points out, if we had a PR system that, that you know, a lot of people seem to really think is a good idea, we would have 20 members of parliament from the People's Party of Canada who would all be in varying degrees uh, completely out of their minds. So, you know, let's let's maybe shelve the talk about proportional representation for a little while and, and get on to more important matters. But, you know, will they still be a presence in the next election? Maybe. But that's that's on the Conservative Party of Canada to decide. Are they going to try to bring these voters back into the fold? Are they going to try to appeal to them and, and sort of unite the right again? Or are they going to, you know, as Supriya said, cauterize the wound and, and just cut them out of, the, out of the tent entirely? I hope they get cut out of the tent because I don't think they're good for politics. Uh, but we will see what the Conservative Party of Canada decides to do with them. Ken, if you were advising the Conservative Party on this, what would you be saying? Look, uh, to quote my uh, former boss, uh, Ralph Klein, the uh, PPC is a pimple on an elephant's ass, and they're not going to be much more than that. I'm, you know, I'm actually relieved that the only party that put forward a clear objection to vaccine passports, a clear objection to the lockdowns, only got 5% of the vote. And I can't imagine we're ever going to be in a situation where there's such a perfect storm for their crazy ideas. And so I, in some ways, I'm relieved that they only got 5%. I had a bet with someone that that they would get less than 5 and my, my dial right now says 5.09%. So I might lose the bet on a decimal point. But I think it's it's good. It's good to see. And I think uh, all governments in Canada should take a lesson from that, that the people who are opposed to rational policy toward this pandemic are a tiny, tiny minority. And we should get together, we should work together and, and move forward on the pandemic, do our vaccine passports, do lockdowns when we need to so we can move forward and get our economy and our, our families uh, back together. Th those talking points, uh, Ken, uh, want me to uh, let our audience know that I'm going to be asking the two of you about provincial politics and the landscape, most especially in Alberta, in a few minutes from now. People are expecting, I mean, there's rumblings. It kind of feels like that groundswell, you know, when the ocean starts to recede from the beach before the tsunami comes. 
comes in. It feels like something's happening in Alberta. Some people are saying that this caucus meeting tomorrow uh, with the United Conservative Party could have huge implications, but we'll keep our focus on federal politics for now. Ken, I was actually pretty impressed, to be honest, with Aaron O'Toole's speech last night. I don't mind that he didn't concede to Justin Trudeau because I think he's, he's, he's got somewhat of a defiant attitude, both within his own party and federally speaking. I think he's expecting another election, he said, within 18 months. He doubled down on, I think, the moderate approach, and he indicated that he intends to stay on as leader. What did you take away from it? I think all of the leaders, except for Justin Trudeau, were speaking to their party members and saying, making their case for why they should remain leader. They weren't speaking to Canadians. And I think you said it right. I think Aaron O'Toole has said to the members of the Conservative Party, there's 5% nut bars over there. And there's, you know, a whole lot, 70% of the electorate on the other side or 65% of the electorate on the other side. And that's the votes that if you keep me on as leader, I'm going to continue to fight for. And those are the, that's the way I'm going to take the conservative party. And I think he's, you know, he didn't earn the right for an automatic uh, staying on as the leader of the conservative party, but he has earned the right to make the case to the conservative party members. And I think that's what he started to do last night. And I'm frankly very encouraged by that. I think I think he moved the party in the right direction on climate change. He's moved the party in the right direction on a number of other issues. And and I think that's the way the party has to go. If we go the other way, we'll, you know, maybe get five percent of the vote. But but I think he made the case to the members and I thought it was a very strong case. And that's the way he wants to take the party. And I think he'll find a lot of support for that. Max, do the Conservatives stick with their horse with Aaron O'Toole or or does he already all of a sudden start looking over his shoulder if he wasn't already? I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, it's not my it's not my tribe, so I'm not real clear on on how they're seeing things. I I mean, Pierre Poiliev is clearly already circling to to take a run at him. Um, if they think that's a good idea, they're out of their God-loving minds because uh, he is exactly the wrong thing for this country at this moment. But I'm honestly not sure. I do hope that that he continues to push in the direction of being a moderate. I, I agree that I thought that part of his speech last night was really encouraging. I would also say, if you want to be a moderate, maybe you should congratulate the person who won the election and be a little more uh, graceful about that. But uh, they haven't figured that part of the equation out yet in terms of being a moderate. Uh, so we'll see how that comes in the next few months. But you're right. He has to protect his his flank before he can start fighting again uh, going forward. And and that's sort of a thing that has saddled the conservatives ever since Harper left is they they can't ever focus entirely on their opponent because they're constantly having to fight these rearguard battles. The conservatives lose 14 percent support in Alberta. That is not a joke, Ken, is it? No, but it's not surprising. Um, we're going to talk in a few minutes about uh, Jason Kenney, and I think there are a lot of people who went to the ballot box last night and thought, ah, the Conservatives are going to win most seats in Alberta. They're probably going to win my riding. I'm a little ticked at the guy uh, running the province, and so I'm just going to mark a ballot for that. So I, I think there was some of that going on. Um, it resulted in four seats going uh, not conservative. And so I think there's some, you know, I think that's significant. I think we we actually had some very interesting races in Calgary and Edmonton. And, uh, you know, I think I think that's going <laughs> to that uh, someone said last night that uh, there's going to be some harsh words between a few of the Alberta MPs and and the provincial premier and the. Uh, you know, in the past, there's been some tension between the provincial government and the federal uh, MPs. But with Jason Kenney being a former federal MP, I think those conversations are going to be a little more interesting than they've been in the past. Yeah, well, let, let me ask you to build on that. What do you mean? I mean, what, what are you forecasting and, and how do you think it'll be different? Well, I think um, it's no secret. Jason Kenney uh, has made some decisions that have hurt him and hurt the province. And he has to be accountable for those decisions. And I've said on a number of occasions in the last number of weeks that he's got not only the policy wrong, but he's got the tone wrong. And I think that's just ticked off a lot of people. So I think there's going to going to be an accounting for that, how the how the caucus and how the party deals with that is going to be an interesting question in the coming week or weeks. And uh, and whether and how the federal MPs play into that is going to be an interesting question. Um, a lot of these conversations will happen behind the scenes, but if they boil over into the public, uh, look out. It'll be fun.
We're going to, uh, we, we just, Max Fawcett just dropped out for a second. Ken, it means you get to talk longer. Can, can I say, I'm, I'm a little, I feel like you and Max, for as adversarial as you are on Twitter, you tend to just tolerate each other. I feel like you're playing really nice in the sandbox this morning. Is, is this a new Ken? Is this a new Max? Uh, uh, no, I just, I think Max and I don't always disagree. And when we agree, we have one tweet and move on. And when we disagree, we have 25 tweets and call each other names and, and act silly, uh, or smart or whatever the people on Twitter think we do. But, uh, we like to exacerbate our differences and, 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 uh, smooth over, uh, smooth over where we're, where we're, where we agree. And I look, I think we do agree on stuff. If you look very carefully, I like some of Max tweets. I don't like retweet them and say, what a great guy Max is. Look how smart he is today. Although sometimes I do that. Uh, but yeah, I think we, we tend to go at each other and have a little bit of fun when we disagree, but that's not all the time. Isn't, isn't that kind of Max, what we need to see more of across the country is, is people who from a partisan standpoint or not know that they disagree on some fundamental issues that can still come together in a forum and respect one another and, and talk it out. Isn't that kind of what the country needs more of? I feel like you're doing a promo for your own show here, Ryan. <laughs> That's exactly uh, what I'm doing. Uh, I mean, look, uh, partisans are going to disagree on certain things. Um, I enjoy disagreeing with Ken, maybe more than is healthy. And, and I suspect the same is true on his end. But uh, at the end of the day, it's important for us to remember that, that we're all Canadians first. We're all Albertans and, and, we're all in this together. And, and maybe that's the part of this election that I found a bit disconcerting at times is it seemed like there was a, a chunk of the population that doesn't feel that way, um, that doesn't feel like we're in it together and that doesn't want uh, everyone to, to do better. So hopefully we can kind of have a, have a conversation about that over the next few weeks and months. But uh, yeah, uh, glad that we're having it here. Elizabeth May. Can wins. I see something else? Yeah, of course, Ken, go ahead. Just quick, uh, this is this has become really important for me. I have friends in the New Democratic Party in Alberta, and I have a lot of friends in the conservative UCP party uh, working around Jason Kenney and for many other offices. And I've been struck over the last number of years how many of them say we never go for a beer with those guys on the other side of the aisle. And I just think that's unhealthy. I mean, when I was when I was in uh, Alberta politics in, in the late 1990s, Howard Sapers was the opposition party. And I, I still keep in touch with Howard. And we, you know, we, we used to talk all the time across the aisle in Stockwell Day would talk to Howard Sapers and his staff would talk to me. And we've just lost that. And I think our politics have become toxic because of it. And I, I just want to put a plug in there. Like I, I've publicly said, very publicly said, Shannon Phillips is a good friend of mine. She's a new Democrat from my hometown. We go for lunch on a regular basis. Max and I disagree a lot, but we can get together and agree as well. And I, I, I miss the days in Alberta politics where the premier goes for lunch with the opposition leader as as ralph klein used to do with pam barrett i well I, I remember i mean two two sort of famous drinking buddies uh in in alberta you know not too long ago former deputy uh premier thomas lukasik and at that time ndp leader brian mason who would clash publicly all the time uh and have sharp words for one another and then are famously quite friendly behind the scenes i remember hearing an, an, a current alberta cabinet minister say to me and posing for a photo at a golf course, boy, I'm going to hear about this one from the boss just for standing in a photo with me. I went, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, what does that even mean? That doesn't make sense at all. That's and nuts. I think a lot of times that tone starts at the top. And I, I mean, I mean, it, it paves the way. Let, let's get right to it. I mean, I want to ask you about the greens and a couple other things. I know that this audience is more than capable of hopping back and <laughs> forth between federal and municipal or federal and provincial politics. Municipally, let me point out, by the way, that, that Kent Harris team, uh, the former uh, liberal minister or associate minister, uh, former liberal MP out of Calgary has just announced um, he's saying it's due to the uh, feeling ill this morning says he had a COVID test doesn't have the results yet but he's immediately suspending all campaign activities uh, calling it uh, a withdrawal from the campaign so that's kind of interesting out of Calgary Kent Hare that's a developing story here as we're recording this live at 1124 Eastern 924 Mountain Time uh, Jason Kenny tomorrow a, a caucus meeting uh, this caucus being described as fractured Depending on who you talk to, you know, there are either two or 11 or 19 or more MLAs that are prepared to walk in whatever context that might look like. Uh, Ken, we'll go to you first. I mean, former chief of staff to uh, a B.C. liberal premier, Christy Clark, which, of course, I'll remind our viewers across the rest of the country, liberal in B.C. provincially is essentially conservative in Alberta. Uh, if you're Jason Kenney's chief of staff, how are you preparing for tomorrow and what are you expecting 
if I was the chief of staff, I would be telling the premier that he's got to go into that caucus meeting and come out of it with a clear mandate that he's got to say we have the waters that are behind us, the waters that are under the bridge are, are much are easier than the waters that are coming toward us. Uh, the hospital system in Alberta, the COVID situation in Alberta, and the economic situation in Alberta, in my view, are going to get worse in the next six months than they have in the last six months. And so he needs to come out of that caucus meeting with a mandate. Uh, he needs to be able to say, I need the support of this caucus to do to deal with these kinds of issues. And we can't be going through a possible revolt or, or a expulsions or whatever else from caucus every three weeks for the next six months. So I, you know, I think he needs to go in there and say, I need the support of a majority of you. And if there's some of you that aren't comfortable doing that, uh, there's the door. And uh, I, that's what he has to do. And I think he has to take the bull by the horns and try and do that and let the chips fall where they may. So Max, if Jason Kenny right now, based on uh, all observations you can make, aside from being in that meeting itself, if Jason Kenny says you're either with me or you're out the door. How many people does he risk standing up and walking out the door? He risks a lot of them because if you're a, if you're a rural MLA in his caucus, you're tired of of having to defend COVID restrictions and get lectured by by you know fancy Jason Kenny. Um, having an election where you know you will win, uh, and then maybe you're in opposition instead of in government, maybe that doesn't sound quite so bad. It's not much of a threat. I mean, look, Jason Kenny spent his best summer ever fucking around, and now he's about to find out, and we'll see just how bad that is for him. Uh, but. I don't think the threat of an election is nearly as big of a deterrent to those people in his caucus as it was even three months ago. So, Ken, if you're I mean, if you're Kenny and if you're his team of advisors and you're saying, I'll 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 take this to an election right now. Aren't you essentially saying if I'm going down, everybody's going down with me? Isn't that kind of the message you're sending? I think there's a few steps that have to happen before we get to an election talk. Uh, I think he needs to have a sense of how many people in caucus truly are going to walk. I think he's got a pretty good proof point in the PPC. I don't have the Alberta PPC numbers ahead of me, but I think they're still pretty small. And he has to say to those people, look, if you guys want to run against the kind of policies that we need to do going forward, uh, here's your here's your vote share. And, uh, you know, give that a real give your head a shake if you think that any party that's going to go in that direction in that kind of a hard way is going to survive and or is going to form government. So you're not just saying I'm going to be out of the government for a term. You're saying if you have those kind of views, you're going to be out of government for a long, long time. You're going to be on the fringe. You're going to be that pimple on an elephant's asset that Ralph Klein referred to when he a long time ago. And so I think it's I think it's serious. I think, you know, what Alberta's facing is serious. Now, Jason Kenney put himself in this position by taking so long to do the right thing. And so I don't have I don't have a deep reservoir of sympathy for him, but uh, he has to move forward. Like I, I honestly believe with supply, all the supply chain problems we have, the economic challenges we're going to face in the next few months are going to be enormous. And I do, I think, as I said the other day on another program, I think we're more in the middle of this pandemic than toward the end. So th we're not through this thing. And we need we need a government that's got their stuff together. And I don't know whether we, need, you know, an emergency uh, I just don't I don't see the new Democrats helping this government in any way, even if we get into an emergency situation. So I think for the good of Albertans, we need to clear this up and we need to figure out how we're going to move forward. And uh, but I think there's a few steps in that path before we get to an election. But if we get to an election, we get to an election. Yeah, I want to I want to follow up on that I, and bring this back to talk on federal politics. I know that the messaging here might be <laughs> tricky. Um, if Justin Trudeau were to tell Canadians or to, to adopt the theme of we're in the middle, like you're saying, Ken, and, and, and as much as I hate to say it, I'm inclined to agree with you that I don't feel like we're emerging out of this pandemic. How can we feel that way? There's more people in Alberta ICUs right now with COVID than there have been throughout the last year and a half. How do we talk about how we're almost out of here? I mean, cases, new cases, more, you know, in, in quadruple digits, more than a thousand every single day. These are numbers right at the height of a wave. Like we're not out of it yet. But at the same time, to go to Canadians and, and say, you don't want to change your horse midstream, this is essentially a referendum on which party you want taking you through the rest of this pandemic, people would rightfully ask, then what the hell are you doing holding an election? You don't have to hold an election if we're in the middle of a pandemic, if that's the theme. So I'll acknowledge it will be tricky. But I'm thinking, if I'm Justin Trudeau this morning, I may not have communicated clearly enough to Canadians that I was running on my record 
of the first year and a half of managing this once in a century health crisis, this pandemic. But really, with no changes, really, generally speaking, no changes to, to, to the landscape, the electoral landscape, Max, I've got to be questioning if I'm Justin Trudeau, do Canadians even respect or endorse the job we've done through this pandemic? I mean, you would think that you would see a resounding result at the ballot box if people were truly happy with how the Liberals managed it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I One of my longest held political beliefs is that voters, voters elect the kind of governments they want. They, you know, they, they may not be able to articulate that individually, but in the aggregate, when, when a government deserves to be to have a majority, they get a majority. And when they deserve to have a minority, they tend to get them. Um, I think the Liberals did a very poor job of explaining why we were in an election. And, and that is, I think, one of the big reasons why they have the minority that they do. But, you know, I, I don't think that he needs to articulate that anymore. That was a missed opportunity. It's in the past. It's baked in. Now we have to, he has to govern. He, the, people do not want another election anytime soon. They want this thing to be over and done with, they want to get out from the other side of it. And he has the support of, of enough people to, to do more or less whatever he wants in terms of bringing those things forward. I, I think I would like to see a stronger hand from the federal government with governments like Jason Kenney and Scott Moe in Saskatchewan, where they have consistently gotten this thing wrong. At every available opportunity, they have made the wrong decision. They have made the wrong choice. I, I have no confidence that they are suddenly going to learn how to make the right choices. And we are Canadians as well as Albertans. So I would like to see the federal government throw its weight around a little more um, in this province in terms of, of how the, the provincial government is, is managing the pandemic. You know, it's interesting. You talked earlier about how there was friction between federal conservatives and provincial ones in Alberta. The friction was because the federal conservatives didn't want Jason Kenney to do anything until the election was over. That's the same wrong instinct, right? That's the exact same wrong instinct, which is do things later, do less, uh, do things in a way that advances their political agenda. Uh, and I, I think we need to kind of root this out a little more thoroughly. Um, it, it, it worries me that if, as Ken says, we're still in the middle of the pandemic, we're saddled with a provincial government that is not going to steer us towards safer shores. Well, let We've me, seen that time and time again. Let me ask both of you to, to comment on that, because, Max, I think you've dug into something, and, I, and I'm going to follow back and ask you when you say you'd like to see the federal government flex a little bit more on the provinces. I mean, that's a huge statement. I imagine that Ken will have a lot to <laughs> – actually, let me just let you say it, Ken, because <laughs> let me let you respond to that before we move on. Look, I think one of the strengths of Canada is that we had the federal government do vaccine procurement and income support, and we had the provincial governments managing – uh, the, the on the ground health stuff. And I think that division of power is healthy. It meant you had two governments dealing with the important sides of the pandemic instead of one. And it also meant that instead of screwing it up for the whole country, the, the places that got it wrong screwed it up for a smaller portion of the country. And I just I don't think the federal government should be stepping into health care or the kind of things the provincial governments are running. I don't think that's productive for anyone. Uh, I would much rather see the provinces get their act together. And, and you know, look, I said it at the time, I think on income support, the federal government with CERB and everything else did a remarkable job going into the pandemic. And let me just say one quick other thing, which is I think the level of support that Trudeau had six weeks ago was reflective of Canadians' happiness overall with their dealing of the pandemic. They misread that as partisan support to reelect them. And they are, they're, they're strategists ultimately misread what I think was a broad level of support for the way the federal government dealt with the pandemic. They re misread that as support for them in a re-election, and that's to their bad, and that's why I think they're the losers in this thing. Uh, the, we, we reference uh, the, the allegations or the implications uh, that the federal conservatives would have asked some conservative premiers, perhaps most especially Jason Kenney, to hold off on either announcing public health measures or taking other action. And, and I'll get to give you both plenty of time to respond to this, but I wanted to get to a tweet uh, from Chris Otram, who says uh, conservative governments in at least three provinces uh, deliberately delayed action on COVID, uh, hoping to outweigh the election before doing the right thing. There needs to be a national inquiry into potential collusion between them and the federal CPC and the related costs to public health. Max? Yeah, let's have it. Bring it on. I, I mean, I think we should have an inquiry into 
uh, the entire management of the pandemic once it's over so that we can learn lessons from, from how every government failed, how every government succeeded, and how we can apply this to to these sorts of situations. Sure, but that's uh, but that's but that's but poly, do, but that's poly talk, Max. Like we should have. A, I agree with you. We should take a look and learn, have best practices, and all that kind of stuff. But this is a more heated implication. Uh, essentially, in plain language, this is that premiers have been holding off on keeping people from getting sick to benefit their federal political affiliates' chances. I mean, that's a hell of an allegation. It is, but but Occam's razor abides. What were they doing if not waiting for the election to be over? Why were they waiting so long to bring in public health measures? It, everyone was screaming at them to do it. Uh, any rational person uh, who was who was sort of governing on the basis of what's best for the healthcare system would have introduced measures weeks ago, and yet they didn't. I think an important question that journalists should be asking is: Were there any senior staffers from the government of Alberta helping out on the federal CPC campaign? And if so. Who are their names and why were they doing it? Because that would seem to me to be a, a potential conflict of interest. In That's terms par of, for the course, uh, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty I, standard I, practice. I, I think that's pretty I standard. I still want to know their names. I want to know who, I want to know who was doing it. I want to know why they were doing it. And I want to know whether that advice bled into the decision by the provincial government to hold back on these restrictions. Yeah, this is crazy. Look, Ford did a bunch of stuff earlier in the campaign. He didn't wait for anybody. I, I think all the all the action and inaction here was on the provincial governments. And and I don't uh, when there's a federal election, provincial governments tend to hold back on policy announcements. That's just how it's always been. Um, Ford announced a, a bunch of stuff earlier, just before the election. He didn't hold back on that. Kenny did. And I think that's more on Kenny and, and Ford's different styles in dealing with the pandemic than it is any kind of interaction between yeah, the federal conservatives. Ken, if you're talking policy, we could be talking policy on some sort of incentive for business or something. This is a pandemic. This is like, you know, health policy to manage rising cases in the middle of a pandemic. It's different, obviously. Yeah, but my point is this is on Kenny. It's not on O'Toole. Oh, because sure. Because Kenny could have acted earlier as as well, Ford actually. did. Ford didn't wait. Yeah, and, and, and I guess the question is whether or not O'Toole would share in this hypothetical scenario would be whether or not he specifically asked the premier of a province – uh, that's experiencing the worst wildfire related to COVID-19 across the country to hold off on public health measures. You're shaking your head. Yeah, I don't think that would ever happen. Like, that's just not, that's just not how you, that's not how you conduct yourself. Uh, um, and the, I think Jason Kenney might have had himself said, well, I sure hope the conserv federal conservatives win. And if I go out now, it's going to cause some problems for them. That might have happened. But that's on Kenny. Uh, that's not on O'Toole. And and so I just don't I just don't buy that there is some collusion between them to to put off stuff. I think Kenny's problems are Kenny's problems and O'Toole's problems are O'Toole's problems. And let's let them deal with them and move on. This is probably uh, go ahead, Max. Well, here's the question. I actually have a question for Ken. I don't mean to usurp you here, Ryan. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if there isn't this sort of relationship, why did O'Toole hold his fire for the last four days of the campaign on Kenny? I would have tossed him straight under the bus. Um, and said he's doing a terrible job. I don't defend his approach to COVID. I think he's, you know, I think he's he's mismanaged this terribly. Instead, he went dead silent. Now, why would he do that? Well, I mean, I said on a I said on a, another show recently, I, and when this was going down, I said O'Toole should say he's in favor of vaccine passports and call it a vaccine passport and let that stand for itself. I think his response was weaker than it should have been, but I don't think he should have thrown him completely. I don't think I would have advised to throw him completely under the bus. I would have done it a little more subtly. I would have, as I just said, I would have advised O'Toole to go out and say, we believe in vaccine passports. That's what's needed right now. Ford has done the right thing, and I believe in a vaccine passport. And I think that would have sent enough of a signal and been on the on on the 75 to 85 percent of Canadians who support that kind of stuff. It was it was a no brainer for me, and I think O'Toole made a mistake there. Okay, so let let me ask you this. Under the bus. Uh, let me ask you this, and and I'll come right back to you, Ken, and then Max. Um, I think we all agree that the word uh, or the phrase uh, vaccine passport has gained significance. Uh, in the province of Alberta right now, whether or not you use the word passport says a lot. What do you make of a senior cabinet minister, Alberta's minister of jobs, economy and innovation, uh, Doug Schweitzer, yesterday tweeting, used the vaccine passport system today for the first time while out for lunch. It was quick and easy at the door, high awareness level for customers. Ken, you first. 
Look, I've shown over the last year and a half, I'm not afraid to criticize my tribe when they make a mistake. I called for vaccine passports a month ago. I called them a no-brainer a few weeks ago. And the fact that they went to a different word to me is just ridiculous. You've got something that's 77% support in Alberta, and they, they, they confuse the issue and they say something that no one knows what it means. Look, political communication should be as clear as possible, using as few words as possible, and they failed to do that. And I think it's again, it's that's on them. Yeah, but no, but that's that's not really what I mean. Uh, I mean, people suggest that Doug Schweitzer could be an heir apparent when it comes to this party's future. People say Jason Nixon, Doug Schweitzer, Sonia Savage. These are kind of the names that come up. How significant is it that he used the phrase vaccine passport? Is that throwing shade at his boss? No, it just means he's a better communicator. Okay. Max, do you believe that? <laughs> no, I think Schweitzer's laying in the cut here. Mm-hmm. Um, he, you know, he's he's been staking out this ground for a while now. Uh, when when the premier's office tried to saddle him with Blaze Bomer and then Blaze attacked Trevor Toome, he sent him packing back to his previous job posting. So, you know, Schweitzer has been very different in tone than the, than the premier, uh, quietly, carefully. But he hasn't traded in the kind of language around vaccines, around freedom that Kenny's been doing. And I think he's staking out a position as the sort of more centrist option if there's a leadership race. And, and you know, I, I think it's pretty good strategy. Uh, I've certainly heard from a lot of conservatives in Calgary who don't like Kenny, who have basically said if, if Schweitzer's the leader, they'll go back to the fold. Mm. So, um I, I think we need to keep an eye on him because he's playing a longer game than than it may appear. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I, this is probably the last time that we'll mention this guy on this show. But Derek Sloan promised, uh, I think it was at the Calgary Stampede. <laughs> Ken, your body language. <laughs> if you're listening to the podcast, uh, Ken just about gave himself a migraine by rolling his eyes so hard. I mean, this guy promised to start a new party, which I, I have to be honest. I mean, there's nothing funny about a lot of the positions that Derek Sloan's taken, and I, I don't mean to make light of it, but I think it's so funny that if you can't find a hope, you're, like the PPC is too moderate for you. Derek Sloan promised to, to create a party. So he runs, uh, this fellow from Eastern Canada, f- a former conservative MP, runs in the Alberta riding, curiously, of Banff Airdrie. Not only does he not win, but the incumbent MP, Blake Richards, returns with 41,000 votes, 57% of the vote. The new Democrat challenger, Sarah Zagoda, with 16%. David Gamble, the liberal candidate, in third with 12%. Nadine Wellwood, the People's Party candidate, in fourth, 5,500 votes. That's 8%. Derek Sloan, running as an independent, finishes fifth in the riding with 1,800 votes. That's 3%. Um I mean, what does that say? You know, we, you combine that with zero seats for the PPC. You take a look at, at, at right winger Kerry Diot loses in Edmonton, Greaseball. Is there a trend here when it when it comes to that right wing sort of? You might even say alt right politicking, Ken. Well, if if the People's Party and the Maverick Party. Are pimples on an elephant's ass? He's the Sloan is the hair on the pimple, and I don't need to say any more than that. Max, I understand why he came west to Alberta. Con- you know, conservative Ontarians have done very well carpetbagging here over the years. Uh, you know, certainly look at our current premier for that. But um, I'm glad to see that Derek Sloan uh, was rejected by Albertans uh, in such humiliating fashion. Uh, may he have great success doing impersonations of Commander Waterford uh, in the future. Uh, fellas, I'm, I'm going to ask every uh, commentator that joins us on the show this morning uh, what I missed. What 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 one other storyline is is top of mind or at least on your radar for right now? We'll acknowledge that there will still be results coming in. Mail in ballots are still being counted today, maybe even into tomorrow, and there could be some numbers that change. Uh, Max, what's one other story that you're keeping an eye on, or an observation you made last night? I'm I am watching what the response is in the Liberal Party in terms of leadership. Um, there has been grumbling, rumbling for a while now about Trudeau and and frustrations with him, um, and I I think it's pretty clear at this point that he has gone from being a sail into being an anchor for the party, and if he leads them into another election, whenever it happens, um, I don't think it's going to go well for him. And so, you know, will the, lib- will the liberals realize this? Will they shuffle him out and bring in someone like Christian Freeland? Uh, I, time will tell. But 
you know, I, 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 despite him winning a minority, despite him, I think being a winner, despite what Ken says, um, I think he needs to be careful about his political future because I don't think Canadians are going to give him another crack at the can. Ken? I think there's a 50% chance we go into the next election with all of the same leaders. And I think there's a 50% chance we go into the next election with an entirely new cast of characters. Hmm. And I think each one of the federal leaders does not have a free pass. Uh, I think Justin Trudeau can make the decision himself more so than maybe some of the other leaders. But I don't think any leader, federal leader right now has a free pass to the next election. And uh, so I would I would extend what Max said to all the parties. I don't think Jugmeet Singh is a free pass. I don't think Aaron O'Toole is a free pass. And so I think all parties are going to have to look at themselves, uh, as a former premier said, in the mirror and figure out or maybe a walk in the leaves uh, and figure out what their future is. So, um, I, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we went into the next election campaign with a completely new set of characters. I'm going to I'm going to assume, Ken, but I just want to clarify that you're talking about the big three or the big four parties. Can, we can all agree that that enemy Paul's goose is cooked with the Greens. Yeah, they're. How, how they won two seats last night is still beyond me after everything they've been through. I just, I, th- their vote is just so concentrated in two ridings. And, and I mean, it's, it, it, if not, we can talk about this for a couple minutes, but, but Elizabeth May uh, is one of the reelected MPs and she's the one that's been sticking the shiv in the back of anime Paul. So that there's going to be some more silly drama in that irrelevant party. So, um, but yeah, what a surprise that they got two seats and thank goodness the PPC didn't get any. So Matt, Max, let me give you a chance to comment on, on, on the, the fate of the greens, uh, as, as we give you both back your mornings. Uh, the two seats are a bit of a mirage. As Ken says, you know, Elizabeth May is Elizabeth May. And then the riding they won in Ontario was because the liberal candidate, uh, was forced to drop out. So when you finish fourth in your own riding, uh, as a leader, that's ball game. And I'm not sure the Green Party will recover. The good news is, as I wrote uh, last week, they kind of won the election in some respects in that all of the major parties had serious climate plans for the first time. So the Green Party as a political entity is probably done. Environmental issues are here to stay. I'm going to quote you on that, Max. All parties had a serious climate plan. Uh, I'm going to use that for months. (laughs) <laughs> you, you can follow these two and and, and their uh, I, I'd call it shenanigans, but let, let me say they're biting back and forth, which is always wildly entertaining on Twitter. Max Fawcett, a columnist with National Observer, uh, he's got it. Max, give us a quick pitch on your sub stack, because I know that's something you launched just within the last few months. How's that going, that project, by the way? It's kind of kind of one of these new digital avenues that a lot of columnists are taking. Well, believe it or not, it's gone so well that the Observer decided to buy me lock, stock, and barrel. So there's no Substack anymore. Oh. It's now just the Observer. So, Atta boy, uh, so re- a negotiating re- tool. Uh, Smart man. There, yeah. Okay, good stuff. Well, that's good news. Congratulations. Ken, how do you pronounce it? Sidicus? Sidicus? Sidicus. Uh, yeah, it's just my consulting firm. I- I've had a lot of fun with the line, though. I- if I'm going to plug something, I'm going to plug the line Please with do. Jen Garrison and Matt Gurney. Uh, great, great. Uh, publication that's you know center right without being partisan we've got a lot of really good people max has written for them too so it's not exclusively center right but uh yeah it's just a great a great group of people with some great uh fiery writing which is uh, always fun to do yeah you bet ken bozen also the, the jw mcconnell professor of practice max bell school of public policy at mcgill university and a research fellow at the cd howe institute fellows this has been great thanks for joining us the morning after the 44th election it's good to see your faces cheers Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, Ken Bosencool, Max Fawcett. If you liked what you saw there on YouTube, go ahead and smash that like button. Tell people about that interview. I think that, I think that some people were expecting a little a little bit more of a dust up there. Those two were very reasonable and respectful, and I'm I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, but but in essence, it it proves that it can be done, uh, and that's not lost on us. And 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 like Max quite aptly pointed out, it was a shameless. Uh, attempted subtle plug at what we're doing here on Real Talk, which is uh, creating an arena for discussion, uh, views that differ uh, in a way, of course, that's always respectful and endeavoring to get to the points that we need to consider. You can leave your comments either on our live chat or, of course, if you want it to be a little bit more permanent, make sure we see it. You can hashtag Real Talk RJ or send us an email. We'll get to our question of the week results in just a moment. Uh, we're asking you about, uh, I mean, you know, it, it's it's really interesting when we start asking folks about the pandemic and, and back to school and, and all these types of things. It's it's uh, in a sense a moving target. 
isn't it? I mean, like Ken just pointed out, says he, he doesn't get the sense that we're we're emerging out of this pandemic. It still kind of feels like we're in the middle of it. Well, uh, almost 900 of you chimed in on our question of the week last week on that, in particular back to school. And we'll get to the results of that before we check in with Melissa Cowett and Dwayne Bratt. Uh, Melissa, a, a political strategist, a public policy expert. She's just hung her own shingle this year, which is really exciting, obviously, with MC Consulting and Dwayne Bratt, a very well-known uh, political scientist out of Calgary's Mount Royal University. First, we want to remind you this morning at granddog.ca, you can place your order in Edmonton, Calgary, Central Alberta for delivery of quality raw dog food. That's right. Grand Dog Essentials is what we feed our dogs, Moses and Monroe. And it's because over time, their team of nutritionists have proven to deliver on the promise they make. That is better health for your dog or dogs based on a diet that's custom designed for them. I particularly like the blog section at granddog.ca. You can learn why some folks have moved from kibble to raw food for their dogs or what your dog's poop is telling you. Also a reminder, you can follow them on Instagram at Grand Dog Essentials. The promo code REALTALK gets you 10% off your first order at granddog.ca. At Friesen Brothers, you've got two more days to get in on the annual, the 44th annual tradition of the Alberta Beef Roundup. It's back till September 23rd. You can get a whole hip of fresh Alberta beef custom cut exactly how you want it ready for your fridge and freezer. That's right. The real butchers at Friesen Brothers work with you to break down that hip into roasts and steaks and stewing cubes and ground round however you want it. You choose and, of course, you can order online at Friesen.com. Our friends at Local Waste, for more than 25 years, have been family-owned and locally operating when it comes to garbage and recycling, pickup, and management. They earn the return business and the new business of their customers because integrity matters to them. Quite frankly, they're not here to get the best possible deal to squeeze you as an entrepreneur and to rip you off. They'll start business relationships small, oftentimes in some cases, growing to bigger deals, bigger bins as your business expands. It's the trust that they've earned as they keep it local at localwaste.ca. As mentioned, we asked you last week uh, where you're at uh, with regards to back to school in this pandemic. And it's probably a good time to remind you that our current question of the week, we call it Get Real Our question of the week is up right now at ryanjesperson.com. Every week, it's presented by the official research and strategy partners of Real Talk, the team at Y Station. So our question of the week this week, another COVID-related question. We're asking you about Alberta's restrictions exemption program, what you think about the new measures, whether you understand them or not, and whether you know how to comply But we're also asking you to dream a little. We wanted to give you something positive to wind up on. Tell us what you would do with a perfect pandemic-free day. Let's get into the results of last week's question. We asked you about back to school and how you're feeling about the pandemic. This survey was conducted between September 12th and 19th. Now, Now, not unexpectedly, you feel very raw about this, Real Talkers. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that there's some serious anxiety when it comes to sending your kids back to school. You told us uh, that transparency is really important. You want to know whether teachers and school staff are vaccinated. You want to know about COVID cases in schools and more. And many of you are certain that your children will encounter COVID in the classroom. Let's get to some of the higher level observations. These are put together by the team at Y Station. They do a great job for us week in and week out. Here are some of the observations that they've made. 48% of real talkers, just under 900 of you chimed in, 48% of you are certain that your child will be exposed to COVID at school this year. Let's call it one and two. Half of you believe your child will be exposed to COVID at school this year. Here's another one. An interesting observation. Again, 6% of you have already had your child exposed to COVID-19 while at school. Now, keep in mind, as I mentioned, this survey conducted from September 12th to 19th. That means that we were two weeks into the school year. 6% of you, your child had already contacted or been in contact with COVID in the classroom. We asked you if you believe that vaccines should be mandatory for school teachers and administrators. How about this? 86% of you, nearly 9 out of 10, said that you believe vaccines should be mandatory 
for school teachers and administrators. I'll count myself among that as well. Of note, by the way, yesterday, Edmonton's fire chief in our hometown, the fire chief of Edmonton, noting that firefighters must be vaccinated if they're going to be on the trucks and in the halls. That's significant, and that's a story that we'll continue to follow. Here's another interesting observation from the team at Y Station. 58% of you that responded, 58% of Real Talkers feel you have a right to know the vaccination status of teachers, administrators, professors, and the like. 58% feel you have a right to know. I want to poll our team because our team has talked about vaccination status and been open about it. Now, different workplaces are different. A lot of people will say, hey, this is a union issue. This is a privacy issue. This is a personal health issue. Do you think that parents, Sarah Hoyles, do you think that parents have a right to know if their child's teacher, principal, receptionist is vaccinated? I think that they should all be required to be vaccinated, and therefore it's kind of, you know, moot. Because, yeah, if they're showing showing up at work, they're vaccinated. I like that take. Sam, what do you think? Do you think that people have a right to know, or is it private health information I, 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 i'm gonna be really boring and agree with sarah and say it's it's you know as soon as you make it a requirement it's a moot point yeah i'm gonna be honest with you guys i think that's the common sense position sam i think we have one other observation from the team at y station before we get to some of the comments that real talkers left on our survey let's get to this prior to the announcement the government's announcement the alberta government that we're asking you about in this week's question Right. This 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 exemption, the restriction program, the the not a passport passport prior to the announcement, two out of three of you, 66 percent were preparing to take the same precautions against COVID-19 that were announced by government. In other words, you were showing the initiative yourself, which is an interesting point. And and I don't think entirely unexpected. Now, we asked you, uh, you know, if your kids are happy about going back to school, obviously there are benefits of them being able to socialize and be with their peers and experience the brick and mortar side of attending school, right? You mostly said to us that the structure and the, and the, and the social aspects, uh, the amenities of the school, like the playground and the gym and all that cool stuff, that that was lifting your, the spirits. Uh, but at the same time, you were anxious for the precautions not being in place, So 54% of you, this is interesting, told us you did not send a child to school this September. This this gives us a sense of where the audience is at with regards to age, demographics, household makeup, etc. 30% of you have one or more child in elementary, junior high, or high school. 5% of you have one or more child in university. And 5% of respondents were teachers that are in classrooms right now. 5% of our respondents were in classrooms Maybe not as they were answering the question of the week, though we wouldn't crack on them for that. I'm sure that they can find the time management there. 38% of you, your kids are fully vaccinated. Kids over 12. And by the way, interesting developments there as well, as we saw announcements yesterday that vaccines are expected to be made available to children under 12 shortly, as research has confirmed that it's all good. And so we'll follow that story. Of course, we'll keep you in the know there. We leave you blank spaces to share your thoughts with us and, and let us know how you're feeling. Sometimes, you know, the, uh, the multiple choice options aren't enough. And so we want to know exactly how you're feeling. We asked outside of those with medical exemptions, legitimate medical exemptions, do you believe that vaccines should be mandatory for teachers and school administrators? We told you the numbers already, but here's how some of you filled in the blanks and expanded on what you wanted to say. One real talker said, this is a really hard one for me to decide on. I I personally believe the science and I personally believe the experts. And for the sake of my own family and friends and, and greater community, I think vaccines should be required. But I struggle with forcing people to take them because body autonomy is important and people should have the right to decide what goes in their bodies. Listener nails it and says this is a complex issue and it leads to the segregation of people in society and I don't know what the answer is and I wish more people would trust the experts instead of those shouting from soapboxes. Another said, hey, this is tricky. I don't think the government should have control of your body, but I do think that this vaccine in particular has been politicized by assholes and it's created a situation we didn't need to have. You know, nobody cared about, you know, vaccines around things like H1N when we just get them, you know, same with all the other vaccines we've had throughout our lives. Another says, yes, I do believe they should be required and teachers with medical exemptions should not be permitted on school grounds until the pandemic is over. Our children's safety outweighs their individual medical condition. Hmm. And another says under the current level of support for schools, 
I do believe vaccines should be mandatory. I would say no, though. I would say no if there had been appropriate investment in adequate ventilation and better budgets for masking, rapid testing, cohorting, contact tracing, and isolation. So a conditional answer from that real talker that took our survey. We wanted to know about something that made you happy about your return to school. One of you said a sense of routine is back, giving us a sense of normalcy. It's hard to tell what qualifies as normal now. Another says, I'm culturally equipped to talk to my kids about being Métis, but I am not equipped to teach my daughter math, science, or anything else, and school is the best place for her. Another says, my son started kindergarten, and he loves it. He's so excited to go every day, and he always asks at supper time if he can go to school again tomorrow. And it's so wonderful to see that. <laughs> I know you two don't have your mics hot right now, but I, I had the same response as you. I went, oh, that's amazing. For little kids, and I won't get too personal with it, but even with our little guy who's very social, last year when his kindergarten experience was, was interrupted, for obvious reasons, and obviously everybody was on board, but we saw evidence, it was undeniable, that it was difficult for him to be away from his peers, to be away from his friends. And I know a lot of parents feel that way. What made you happy about the return to school? One of you said nothing. I fear the school year ahead. I fear it due to the rampant spread of COVID and the lack of public protections. I also feel that loud and increasingly unhinged anti-maskers are trying to have their will imposed on all of us in the school system. We asked how you're feeling about living in Alberta right now. And, and this is where we'll wrap this for now. This was actually this question, an addendum, because obviously the climate in Alberta right now is superheated. And as I said before, for those surfers that are listening in, we know we have an audience tuning in this morning from Dominical in Costa Rica, for example. Oftentimes you'll feel these swells before you start to see the big sets come in, before the big waves start to come in. So how are you feeling about living in Alberta right now? This could be a big week when it comes to provincial politics here. One of you said, I feel a real Alberta disadvantage taking away things like health care, public education and post-secondary education that you can access in other provinces makes me feel like a second class Canadian. Letting people die to cater to business is callous and cruel and direct attacks on citizens for beliefs. Like environmentalists makes me feel like I'm living in a fascist dictatorship. Another one of you said it's complicated. I love Alberta and I always will, but it's really getting tiresome. My partner's a primary school teacher in a less than progressive conservative voting district. And what she's had to endure over the past year and a half is mind boggling. And this goes double or triple for our friends who are nurses. Another one of you said, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm disappointed with this government in, in so many ways. It's a beautiful province, and I've lived in two others besides Alberta. I'm sad that people are suffering and that our reputation has taken so many hits. How long will it take to undo the damage to our economy, health care, and social programs? Went on to say, I volunteered for the Liberals in this federal election for the first time to put my feelings into action, and I'll be raring to go when the provincial election rolls around next time working for Rachel. Another says, I love this province, but it's embarrassing right now. I have family in BC and Ontario, and I, and I get text messages asking me what's wrong with this province. I've done my part. I got vaccinated as soon as I could. I limit interactions with friends. I work from home whenever possible, and we're right back to where we were when this pandemic started. The word exhausted popped up time and time again, which is obviously very significant and very telling. Many of you are feeling exhausted Another says, I can't believe there are protests outside hospitals as beds are full. Another one of you said in all caps, major, major props to all those of you that are still trucking along in healthcare. Our family appreciates everything you've done and everything you'll continue to do, even in the face of these protests. And another says, it's exhausting, the right-wing rhetoric, the hate, the deliberate divisiveness, the polarization. That's not the community I want to live in. I want everyone to get along. That real talker signed off, peace and love. Sarah Hoyles has an observation. 
Well, I just wanted to flag that you're nicely illustrating how we go through all the comments because oh, yeah. yesterday we received a tweet from Vicky and G said, I wonder if anybody reads what I write for my Real Talk RJ survey Oh, absolutely. Responses. It's like I'm yelling my feelings into the void. <laughs> Very calming. And so I wrote back saying, yeah, we sure do. And can you confirm this? Yeah. Uh, I asked the y, y station, can you confirm this? And they said, oh, yeah, we have a whole team of working to read the survey responses. Keep it up. Well, and I want to I want to let's get, just give a quick shout out. And I really appreciate you bringing that up, uh, because as we've said, we leave as much time as we can. We do it. We know that this is a long show. We know that, you know, we, we do a minimum of 10 hours live, oftentimes 13 hours uh, live uh, through the course of every week. And there's a lot of ground to cover. We try to make as much time as we can for audience response by way of, of tweets and live chat comments and emails. And of course, these survey responses are huge because not only do we present them, you know, in the beginning half of every week, they're also many of them contained in the, in the top line reports. If you support us on Patreon every month and you can find details on that at the top of our website, RyanJesperson.com, you receive every Monday morning the top line report, typically 20 pages from the team at Y Station. So you're getting in-depth analysis, really invaluable stuff if you're trying to put your finger on the pulse of of wherever real talkers are at. Sometimes they're federal issues. Sometimes we're talking about international events. In this case, we're talking about, in particular, this week, the question that's live right now on our website, how you feel about Alberta's restrictions exemption program. So we get a little bit more local from time to time. But of course, even the comments that we don't read out to the audience are comments that we're pondering, and oftentimes they're shaping the editorial direction that the show is taking. So we always want to hear from you. I should give a shout out to the team at Y Station. Uh, their team, uh, Chris and Emily and others, they took this on nine months ago, and it meant that they were working on Sundays when they typically weren't before. Like, we get these top-line reports sometimes. Oil, Sam, you see them in our inbox. We'll get these top-line reports sometimes at 1 in the morning because they've been crunching hundreds and hundreds or, in some cases, thousands of responses. Nearly 5,000 of you chimed in on our Aloha Gate question of the week. Almost 5,000 of you. We average around 1,000. I'd love to see it up around 1,500. That, to me, is just a nice number, 1,500. So maybe take two or three minutes out of your day every Monday and chime in on our question of the week. We would so appreciate it. Presented by our official research and strategy partners at Y Station. Uh, we'll get to, in, in just a moment, uh, Dr. Dwayne Bratt, Melissa Cowett. We wanted to remind you that our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park we're talking about Baseline Road, Westmount, Palisades, Nemeo, and Newcastle are ready to help you embrace fall with a couple of their favorite treats. The cool treats that are the pecan pie and the pumpkin pie blizzard treat blends. The pumpkin pie blends the world famous soft serve with real pumpkin pie pieces garnishing it with whipped topping and nutmeg. People are loving that. And of course, the pecan or pecan pie blizzard treat, bound to be a crowd favorite no matter how you pronounce it, with its crumbly brown sugar pie pieces, crunchy pecans, creamy caramel, and that world-famous Dairy Queen soft serve, also with the whipped topping. When you go through that drive through or head in store to those five locations, you make sure you let them know you're there because you're a real talker. They love to hear it. They love to hear it. Our friends at Park Power are every single day welcoming new customers who sign up online at parkpower.ca. We've told you before how this works. You don't have to have that awkward breakup conversation with your current provider of internet, electricity, or natural gas. The team at Park Power handles it all. And when you bring your business over today using the promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to take $70 off your first bill. 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. Our federal election coverage continues right now with a couple of longtime friends of mine. Melissa Cowett has had a big year herself professionally, stepping out, hanging her own shingle at MC Consulting, a public affairs expert and a political strategist, Dr. Dwayne Bratt, longtime friend, and of course, a big shot when it comes to political science commentary across the province out of Calgary's Mount Royal University, uh, making his Real Talk debut this morning. It's great to see both of you here. Uh, Dr. Bratt, we'll start with you. I've asked the guests this morning the same question. When you woke up this morning 
and you've had some time to sleep on the results of the federal election, at least as well as we know them right now. What was the first storyline that came to mind? What's top of mind today? Oh, very little sleep. Let, let's emphasize that. Um, it, it's actually two. One is, oh, my God, this was the most boring election result I could imagine. It's a rerun of 2019. But the second one, when I get a bit more narrow, is looking at, at the issues in, in Alberta. And if I was a provincial conservative this morning looking at last night's results, I am very worried. Melissa, would you concur? Would you agree? Would you be that concerned? I think I would be. I, I have to just say, I I mean, you know this, I am a conservative, but I am so impressed by the fact that the NDP were able to pick up uh, another seat in Edmonton, it looks like, in, in Edmonton Griesbach. Like, I think that's just really speaks to the fact that campaigns really do matter um, and the effort that these candidates put in, that central campaigns put in, it's a big deal. And so I, I um definitely uh think that that's something that the ndp should be proud of um it's it's a huge deal just in terms of of the makeup in alberta but um yeah it's it's largely the same result that we've seen from before so th- then what ends up happening typically when we have very little change is we start to like read into a bunch of the nuances and maybe put meaning where there isn't meaning but i guess that will all come out uh, in the wash as we we tally mail in ballots and, and get more of a final result on some of these seats that are uncertain. So uh, I would echo Melissa's point. If you look at Blake Desjardins and you look at George Chahal in, in Calgary, two very strong candidates who worked extremely hard um, and with support from the national campaign. Trudeau spoke with Chahal in Calgary and Jagmeet Singh spoke with Blake not once but twice. And so it really did show that when campaigns really dig in, they get the right candidate in the local in the right riding with support from the national team. It can make a difference. So you've got representation for the Liberals down in Calgary with with former Calgary City Councilor George Chahal. It looks like the Liberals could pick up Edmonton Center. Randy Boss, no, I'm sure holding his breath is that's within about a hundred votes right now. I think 136 last time I checked over the incumbent James Cumming, the Conservative candidate there, and and then as mentioned, Blake Desjardins uh, taking out Kerry Diod, who won by a wide margin. Uh, back in, in 2019, it's it's one thing for the Conservatives to lose 14% support in Alberta. It's another to lose seats. So what's Aaron O'Toole talking to his team about this morning in that context, Dwayne? I, I think they're going to point the finger away from Aaron O'Toole, and they're going to point it directly at Jason Kenney, and they're going to make the connection that, that uh, and this may be unfair to Jason Kenny. Um, I think O'Toole was in trouble about ten days ago. I think he started the slide over the flip flops on guns, but last week was just devastating. Um, the 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 health crisis, the economic crisis hitting um, Alberta was national news. Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau did a very good job of linking O'Toole and Kenny. And that press conference in New Brunswick on Thursday morning when he was hounded O'Toole for 15 minutes and he couldn't remember Jason Kenney's name or find Alberta on a map, I think was really bad for him. And that's why I think to protect O'Toole's own leadership, because he's got threats from within, he is going to try to paint it as it's Jason Kenney's problem. Melissa, you see that happening? Perhaps. I think it's a bigger issue than just Jason Kenney, though, even though that undeniably plays into into voters' thoughts, because um, I've said this before, voters are super smart, but it's really hard to think of provincial conservative parties and federal conservative parties as different entities when there are so many connections. I mean, Jason Kenney was a federal conservative at one point, right? So it is hard to sort of separate the two, but I think it just speaks to the conversation that... Um, maybe we're not quite having yet, but perhaps we will start having in this country about what the sort of brand and direction is of our mainstream conservative parties. I think that there's always this anxiety, um, or at least there has been for the past 10 or so years, of keeping big tent conservative parties together. This happens provincially, as we've seen in Alberta, but also federally. Um, And to do so, 
you need to make sure, or historically, you need to make sure that people from center left of the party to all the way to the far right feel welcome and, and same with supporters. And so I think that what the, the federal conservatives are going to walk away from this is um, looking at exactly what the brand of conservatism uh, is for the party, because they tried this election to move a bit more to the center. And it's clear that there's still a bit of a brand issue because they weren't able to shake, even though Aaron O'Toole himself changed his position on um, a lot of contentious issues and presented a much more progressive uh, stance than we've seen from conservative leaders in the past, it doesn't appear to have been enough. And it, it appears that they were trying to do a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And that's probably going to be need to need to be refocused in advance of the next election if they want to pick up some more seats. Uh, Dr. Brad, I don't know about you, but I mean, my take on this and I, and I, and I was clear about it earlier in the show is that I, I was pretty impressed, actually, with Aaron O'Toole's speech last night, because uh, in my mind, he doubled down where I think he needs to continue to boldly take the conservative party if he's going to win. And and, and I think that it, there was a certain defiance to the right wing flank. And, you know, I was talking to a friend last night and I said, I, I think you, you need to respect your base and respect voters across the country. But you need to be willing to lose five percent support on the prairies in order to gain five to ten percent support in, in Ontario and in Toronto. Do you think that he has the ability to continue to take the party there? Do you think that's the sincere direction that he believes he's going to take it? Or do you think this morning people are saying, well, moderation or moderate approaches didn't work this election. It's time to go back to what worked for us in past. That's the existential question facing the Conservatives and Aaron O'Toole. There was a reason that last night's speech he did not direct to Canadians as a whole, but to his own party. And it was almost like, we're taking these steps. Give me another sh shot at it. Give me another chance, and, and we can make more inroads. And because if, if you just take the carbon tax issue, he brought in a very convoluted, complicated plan back in April. And I've had this debate with Andrew Leach because Andrew Leach takes it, um, you know, technically serious. And how do you implement all this? And I said, Andrew, you're looking at it the wrong way. It was never designed to be implemented. It was to take the issue off the table. And it was. We had a 35-day election campaign. You rarely heard carbon taxes, climate policy in that campaign. Yeah. But there are members of his own party who are upset with the, the steps that he took, right? And so do you roll that back? I thought he easily, in the first week of the campaign, swatted away traditional liberal attacks on, on abortion and, and private health care. And then they got to the gun question and it was like they were unprepared for a liberal attack on guns. Like, really? You're unprepared for that? You were prepared for the abortion and the health care stuff. Why not the guns? And that's where I think the slide started when he had to flip flop on guns where he could have come out and said, hey, we agree with the liberals. We agree we should get assault style rifles and guns off the streets. Where we disagree is what constitutes an assault rifle, mm. you know, and therefore we'll have a comprehensive review with experts and blah, 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 blah. That's not what he did. And and I think that's where it showed vulnerability. And there were people who said, I believe Aaron O'Toole, but there's elements in that party I don't believe. And the, the, the Stephen Harper dealt with the same thing, but in the 2004 campaign, but by the time 2006 rolled around and they asked him about that, he basically said, I'm the leader, I'm in charge. And people looked at Stephen Harper and go, oh, yeah, he is. <laughs> it's not going to happen. There was something Harper had this kind of special sauce, didn't he, Melissa, where he, he was able to 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 I think when, when I say treat, I mean, it's going to it's going to sound like, you know, a certain way people can take it how they like. But he was able to treat his MPs or treat his cabinet, or treat his base, or treat Canadians a certain way and, and get away with it, right? When it came to communication around government-employed scientists or when it came to, to keeping backbenchers in line, he was able to pull it off, and he was able to form government. He was able to serve as prime minister for, for about 10 years. But, but if you look at typically conservative parties, they'll acknowledge that voters across the political spectrum don't like to be told what to do and think and how to act, but typically, people push back on that kind of stuff. Now, was that unique to Stephen Harper, or can, can Aaron O'Toole channel that to a certain degree? 
I think he can, but he has a different challenge today than Harper had back in the early to late 2000s. Our society is different today. And also the memory of conservatives of what it was like to be uh, perpetually in opposition while divided is a bit more distant. Um, I mean, it's becoming a little bit more refreshed um, after these last couple of elections, but you can kind of forget um, what it it's like when you don't stick together or try to put forth policies that are best for the country. So I think that Aaron O'Toole can definitely get to that place. Um, but I think that he's, you know, to your point, Ryan, he's got to continue to speak the language that Canadians are speaking. The, the struggle with that will be though, and he did struggle with this during the campaign, is continuing to link that to conservative values, but reimagined and more current um, expression of those conservative values. So take, for instance, the carbon tax. We're not debating anymore about a carbon tax, but let's present the most conservative minded option for the carbon tax, meaning what we do with the money, how we collect uh, those taxes from folks. You know, we're not talking about child care as being a social issue anymore. We're talking about it as being infrastructure. So how do we put forward a plan um, that is with conservative principles in mind? So you're not debating the the need for certain policies, you're debating the how of certain policies. And the last thing I'll say about that is that is where the conservatives have and may continue to run into trouble is that their explanation for their policy solutions are often more complicated to communicate, explain than other parties. $10 a day childcare, very easy to understand and communicate. So I think the conservatives will have to figure out a way to um, to communicate their remedies for our real societal problems today in, in a way that people can more easily understand so they can then relate to them and maybe start to support the party a bit more. Dwayne, if you're Justin Trudeau this morning, you're disappointed you didn't form a majority government, but you're probably not surprised. I, 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 have, I have a sense that they knew the way that this was going to go almost from inception, which maybe begs the question why they called the election in the first place. But but are you looking at essentially another 18 to 24 month window to try to convince Canadians it's time to do it all over again? Uh, yeah, typically that's how long minority governments uh, last. But look, at I think he was not surprised last night, but I think if you went back to Justin Trudeau of, of August 15th, he would have been surprised. The fact that on the last day of the campaign that your selling feature is we need to elect the Liberals to keep Aaron O'Toole out of uh, the Prime Minister's office, you didn't need to call an election to have that opportunity emerge. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen in, in the weeks to come. But a couple months from now, I think there's got to be a reckoning within the Liberal Party and amongst Justin Trudeau himself uh, about whether what is his future as leader. This is back to back minority governments, back to back times and, and won by a choice, an election by choice, back to back losing the popular vote. He is polling below his party. He has been embroiled in multiple personal scandals. Uh, and there's a couple contenders sitting in the wings uh, waiting to waiting to go. So come February, is Trudeau taking another walk in the snow like his dad saying, you know, I've gone about as far as I can uh, I can go. What it what it would tell me if I was a liberal is that Canadians like liberal policies. They like ten dollar a day care. They like a carbon tax. They like the economic supports of covid. Um, we haven't quite got to the reckoning of how to pay for all of this yet. Uh, but they weren't happy with Justin Trudeau. Who do you perceive to be the contenders? I'll ask both of you, but Dwayne, in, in follow-up, uh, everyone says uh, Christy Freeland as one. Uh, who else can you see in the wings there that you think would make for a compelling leader? I'm going to show, I, I, I think that he's, he's. I don't understand the, the, the dynamic completely. I'm not going to pretend like I'm in those back rooms, but I think someone like Seamus O'Regan is, is a pretty compelling person as well. I was surprised to see Miriam Monsef lose last night in a way. Not that I'm throwing her name into the leadership mix, but but that was, I, I think, a high-profile if you want to call her an up and comer, sort of a next gen type liberal personality, a former cabinet minister there, Dwayne, who would you have on your short list? Oh, I think you've got to put Mark Carney on there as well. Really I though? Carney... Dwayne, you took my response. Oh. No, but that's, that's become a punchline. You really think for no, real? It's, it's not, it's not a punchline, 
right? I mean, it is clear he is angling, but he did not want to go in as part of Trudeau's team. Sure. Right. He is waiting to replace Trudeau. And I know the conservatives are all ready to say, compare him to Michael Ignatieff. He is not Michael Ignatieff. It is one thing to be uh, a public intellectual like Michael Ignatieff. It's another to actually be doing policy like Mark Carney was at, at the Bank of Canada um, and, and at the Bank of England. But I agree with Seamus O'Regan. He has been of the last two years the surprise of that cabinet yeah. because he was, he was seen as a lightweight. Uh, there's something about being a, a morning TV host, uh, Ryan, that uh, get that lightweight <laughs> easy, uh, easy, reputation. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you look at the role he's done on natural resources and the fact he's got a strong relationship with Sonia Savage in Alberta, the, the fact that he is promoting small modular reactors that is supported by both the conservatives and, and the liberals. And he does have some personality and he does have some, some, some French and we've never had a Newfoundland leader before. You know, I would not dismiss Seamus o, o, O'Regan. You have to wonder his, if uh, talk show past d- despite, and that's, I appreciate you not discriminating against the future potential of past morning TV hosts, Dwayne. Um, yeah. You've always given me the benefit of the doubt. And I see you're doing <laughs> the same for, for Mr. O'Regan, Mr. O'Regan, let's call him right now. I wonder if that could be an interesting, I mean, I'm not calling it by any stretch. This is just pure, uh, you know, speculation, but you have to wonder if that Seamus O'Regan, Reagan Sonia Savage relationship could one day describe the prime minister and the premier of Alberta. Who knows? Melissa, uh, y- you said that Dwayne stole Mark Carney right off your short list. Who else would be on there? I think, I don't know if we've said Christia Freeland yet, but she's sort of the heir apparent right now in the Liberal Party. I mean, Deputy Prime Minister, she's seen as a very strong, uh, as a very strong member of caucus. So I think that she would be a very interesting choice. She um, throughout the campaign had a couple of gaffes, which seemed a little bit uncharacteristic of her, but, uh, I think she's worked really hard and I think, uh, it would be not terrible for the West, um, to have a liberal party or a liberal government led by Christia Freeland. She's from Alberta. I know that she has been, um, even though it might not seem like it, um, to the public, she's been a pretty fierce advocate for Alberta's interests, um, behind closed doors. So, I, I think that would be a really good option um, for Western Canada, at least, uh, depending on how it shakes out. What are the two? If of you, it happens, let's uh, let, let's turn our attention back to provincial politics. And I know we hop back and forth, but I mean, I can't remember. I mean, the, the intertwined nature of these storylines is is undeniable. Tomorrow on Wednesday, for people that are listening right now, we're talking about Wednesday, September twenty second. There will be a United Conservative Party caucus meeting. Um, Melissa, what are you expecting to happen there? I mean, people are forecasting s- some pretty significant potential outcomes. I mean, the most significant, probably Premier Jason Kenny walking away. Uh, other people are saying that's not how Kenny's hardwired. That's not something that he would entertain. And if he was going to do it, he'd probably drive the party into the ditch along with him. What do you think tomorrow means for the future of the UCP, Melissa? I think it's tough to say. What I do know is that there have been a lot of um, sort of threats and big talk that have happened um, for many months now when it comes to some of the issues that the provincial conservatives face. I don't know if we're now in such a different spot where that could change, but um, they're going to have some hard conversations for sure because they're they're in a tough spot. And the road, whatever that road is for the party, I'm not talking about Premier Kenny because I think we need to start thinking about the UCP um, in terms of not just based on any one person. That party is going to have a lot of tough decisions to make in terms of how they move ahead to earn back the trust of Albertans because they've they've lost the trust of Albertans. And I think they know that and and realize that at some level. And now it just becomes what is the best path and what does that look like for the party? So I do hope that they're having some of those difficult discussions. But I mean, we've been talking about tough discussions for a long time and and we haven't necessarily seen uh, anything materially change. So we'll see. Dwayne, the, the thinking, if you talk to the New Democrats, uh, either on or off the record provincially, is that they don't want Jason Kenney to go anywhere. Uh, Jason Kenney is the best thing to happen to Rachel Notley and the New Democrats' chances next election than anything else. That's the position that, that they're taking, though none of them have plainly said it on the show right now. Would you agree? Ask Daniel Smith. 
right? And Daniel Smith never wanted to see Ed Stelmack leave. Hmm. And then Daniel Smith never wanted to see Allison Redford leave. And so from a very narrow, narrow partisan lens, uh, I think the NDP would love to see Jason Kenney, a very wounded Jason Kenney, a, a year and a half from now. But I think there's bigger issues at play. And, and the issues are uh, about people getting sick, people dying, babies not getting surgery. That trumps any partisan advantage for either party. And I think we have to start looking at the future of, a, of, of the, the province instead of just, and I'm a political scientist saying this, not the politics of this. We've got business people that are absolutely confused about what the rules are to open. Uh, it, it, we've got over 100,000 university students where we have told them in the span of about two weeks that all you have to do is self-declare that you're fully vaxxed. You've got till January 1st to prove that you're fully vaxxed. You've got to September 21st to show that you're, you're fully vaxxed. We keep changing the rules on Albertans, and it has led to anger, and it has led to, to sadness. So I would put some of the partisanship away, and I would think that, that the removal of Jason Kenney is good for the, the, the province. Dwayne, as an aside, uh, and pardon me for not knowing this, uh, you yourself, of course, at Mount Royal University, are you in in-person classes right now? And, and if so, what's the policy of the university and with regards to vaccines? And if so, how do you, you know, or regardless, how do you feel so about it? We're, we're in-person classes. We wear masks. I am happy to be in class, but I can tell you lecturing for back-to-back -back classes for three hours with a mask yeah. is not easy to do. No kidding. But I'm still happy to see their smiling foreheads because I can't see their teeth. But last Wednesday night, um, we had to cancel classes on Thursday and Friday because we didn't know what the new rules were. Mm. And we didn't make that announcement until close to 11 o'clock at, at, at night. And so there is a lot of confusion on campus. You cannot tell me that 98% of our students at Mount Royal, and we have over 12,000 students, are fully vaxxed especially when we know what the stats are for that age cohort. So right? with regards to students or faculty and staff, there's no directive that you must be vaccinated or there is? Yes, yes there is. Oh, there now. is. Okay. And you have to show proof. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Donna on our live chat here on YouTube says, I think that Jason Kenney wants to get back to federal politics and he will leave before he loses to Rachel Notley. Uh, Melissa, to you in just a second, let me say, I, I do believe that no matter how damaged the Kenny brand is right now, if he if he ran uh, anywhere in Calgary, if he ran anywhere in Alberta, he would still win by a wide margin. There's no doubt about that. Jason Kenny certainly could return to federal politics. The question is, could he ever get to the point where, you know, he'd be satisfied, which, of course, you have to assume would be the leadership and ultimately becoming prime minister uh, too little too late. Melissa, is that a possibility or no? I think it'd be really tough uh, to go from the role that he's in now to being an opposition MP um, federally. So, I mean, I guess time will tell. And again, trying to predict anything that happens um, in Alberta politics for your viewers that are tuning in from outside of the province is um, a fool's errand. Um, I just don't know. Um, I don't think that he would want to do that, but we'll see. He didn't want to be uh, an opposition MP before. Uh, I have a hard time believing he'd want to be again. But, Dwayne, can you see it happening, or is the, the brand permanently no. damaged? No, he has gone from, and I said this two years ago, the most powerful conservative in the country. He was more powerful than Andrew Scheer, without a doubt. He was more powerful than Doug Ford, without a doubt. I think the, the Kenny federal conservative brand, the federal provincial or provincial conservative brand, has been greatly damaged. And I think you're going to start to see people on the record, not just, you know, anonymous conversations coming out against Jason Kenney uh, for their own purposes, for their own self self-preservation. Um, and so I don't even if he could win in a Calgary riding and it would have to be the right Calgary riding uh, to go from being premier of a province to being a backbench opposition member, um, you know, that uh, you may love politics. If politics has been his life that's not something you're going to to do when when you've been minister of immigration when you've been minister of defense uh i'm not sure that you sign up for that i agree uh, melissa are you are you coming to us from vancouver this morning 
I am. Okay. Yes. I want to ask you, lucky, lucky you. Uh, I, I want to ask both of you uh, just about municipal politics before we wrap and let you get back to your days. Uh, but I'm not sure. I want to be fair to you, Melissa. I, I know that you're certainly politically engaged and aware. I don't know how close of attention you've been paying to mayoral races in, in Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, but but I'm curious to know what both of you think about this uh, one storyline as of this morning. Uh, Dwayne uh, Kent Hare, the former Liberal Associate Minister, uh, former MP, former MLA uh, out of Calgary Buffalo, uh, withdrawing from the Calgary mayoral race. I think it was a curious entry to begin with. Um, I know that progressives in particular supporting Jody Gondek uh, were piling on Kent Hare when he announced his candidacy. It only lasted for, I think, about a week, maybe a bit more than that. Curious to know your thoughts on that. Curious to know where you think Calgary is going to go. There are a few legitimate contenders there. And also in Edmonton, what do we read into Kerry Diot losing and Max Bernier losing and Derek Sloan losing? And what does it mean for Mike Nickel? Does this mean good news for Amarjeet Sohi? Dwayne, why don't you go first? Oh, you've just thrown a whole bunch of stuff in there. So I'll start with the easy stuff. I was happy to see Derek Sloan finish fifth in Banff Airdrie. Uh, I, I joked last night that he finished fourth in the conservative leadership race and fifth in Banff Airdrie. <laughs> um, and I was happy to see Maxime Bernier lose his seat for a second straight time. Um, but getting to the mayor's race, uh, Kent Hare has also said he's very concerned about COVID. Uh, he thinks he may have it yeah. uh, with the new variant. Uh, he is a paraplegic. There is a link between spinal cord injuries and, and COVID. But at the same time, I don't think you can ignore the fact that he entered the race only right after Labor Day, um, got piled on the moment he announced, uh, and is now pulling, uh, pulling out. I think if Kent Hare had ran in April, he is such a strong campaigner. Like, it's unbelievable. Everybody in Calgary knows Kent Hare uh, because he's, he's just a, a campaigning machine. I think he's a better campaigner than he can govern, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but it, it's almost like he was in and he was, he, he was out, which probably makes the Jody uh, Gonda camp uh, quite happy. Uh, we'll have to see. I mean, the, the municipal race has been put on hold for a month. Um, now it's restarting. I am more interested in the non, uh, the referendums. What does this mean about equalization, right? Um, because who is the big salesperson for the equalization referendum, right? Can he sell it now? The anger towards Ottawa, it's tough to make that case today as opposed to election morning in 2019. And so what is the impact on, on the equalization uh, referendum? We've been uh, privy to some some communications, this big email list that goes out, and it's been interesting to see a lot of really partisan, committed conservatives encouraging one another to start treating that referendum question like a referendum on the premier and to vote against the way that they think that he'd like to see it go. I always figured that was going to be an 85% yes if Albertans want to see equalization renegotiated. I'll be curious to see where it goes right now. Dwayne, before I move on to Melissa, let me ask you, uh, what you make of the Calgary race and who you think is going to be the next mayor there. And if you're paying any attention at all whatsoever uh, to the race that's happening in Edmonton, I'd just be curious to know what your crystal ball is telling you today. So uh, I'm actually coming up with opposite views. So I am following Edmonton briefly as, as well as I, I can. And, and I think Amarjit Sohi will be the next mayor of, of Edmonton, yeah. uh, you know, uh, a month out, um, especially the election results last night shows that a, a progressive uh, can can win uh, and taking on the mantle of, of Don Iveson. Down in Calgary, I think we could be in a very different situation and we could have the first conservative mayor that I can ever remember because Ralph Klein, when he was mayor, was surely not a conservative. Uh, and that's Jeremy Farkas. And Farkas has a, uh, uh, um, a small group, but a very enthusiastic group in a multi-person race that may be enough. And if you're upset with City Hall and you want someone to go in there and just blow the whole thing up, Jeremy Farkas will do that. Um, and so we'll see a year, uh, a year, a month is a long time in the campaign. Uh, and who knows how a head to head with Gondek and Farkas might look, but you've got 28, 29 other candidates. But there's a lot of Farkas signs. And if you're upset with City Hall, and there are a lot of people up with upset with City Hall, Farkas is your guy. Yeah, and let's also just state the obvious, though, that mayors have to find ways to work with councillors to make anything happen. So you got somebody coming in, blowing up City Hall. The other interesting... Oh, they don't, they don't care. 
You yeah, know, that, that, that's for after the election, it's, right? <laughs> we'll figure that out later. And you lose yeah. some high profile so-called progressive counselors that are currently running for mayor, right? Jody Gondek will obviously not return uh, yeah. as a counselor because she's seeking the mayor's chair. M- Melissa, what do you think? Do you concur? Do you think that Jeremy Farkas could be the next mayor down in Calgary? I think with the number of people that are running to Dwayne's point, um, yeah, I mean, anything can happen. It's so hard to predict when there's that many uh, when there's that many factors. I do think it'll be interesting, though, because our sentiment in Alberta, um, at least from the tone from the provincial government up until a few months ago, was really that, you know, to Dwayne's point about the referendums, anti-Ottawa sticking up for Alberta. And we saw that start to seep in municipally um, because we've seen, obviously, Mike Nickel, who really embodies that kind of vibe. I, I don't know what he's trying to do, frankly. Um, but Jeremy Farkas as well, um, in a bit um, a bit more of a principled way, not much, but a bit more of a principled way than than Mike Nickel does. And I, I think that that was really resonating with voters. And this this municipal campaign, like these candidates have been contemplating this, some of them since like last fall, and a lot has changed since then. So I'm interested to see whether people in Calgary and Edmonton in particular, look at what happened federally and look at whether or not being anti everything is a good strategy to get things done and how that manifests municipally. But the issues municipally center around a lot of um, local issues like development and like things that are really close to people's um, everyday lives. And so if people are still super frustrated with how um, some of those things are going, then they could want a change candidate. But I just don't know that that like wave of anti this and anti that is going to carry through after this after this last election and especially what's happening uh, provincially, because that's really where a lot of um, a lot of that sentiment started was was provincially. And that is waning now. So I think it will have an effect municipally. But with so many candidates, it's really tough to say. But um, I I do hope that some of those um, progressive candidates are able to pull through. Um, Amarjeet Sohi, I know, is doing well um, up in Edmonton. Uh, and, and same with Jody down in Calgary, though there's lots happening. So we'll have to see. We'll have to have another post Alberta oh. municipal election conversation. We will. And I'll look forward to it. Dwayne, can I t- take us into the weeds for a second here? And I'm putting you on the spot. I apologize. I should know the answer to this. But is there a minimum vote you have to achieve to become mayor? I mean, in theory, if there's no. thir- if there's 30 candidates, could you win with you know, like 11% of the vote? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, All you got to do is finish first. All you got to do is finish first. I think, Melissa, it's important as well that you brought up the fact that, you know, relationships matter between municipalities in the province. Uh, I recently hosted a, a mayoral candidates forum um, sponsored by a, a consortium of seven different real estate related entities in Edmonton. And there was a lot of talk around the perception or the reality that the relationship right now between the city of Edmonton and the province of Alberta is very strained. And wouldn't it be interesting and ironic to see if Alberta were to flip provincially two years from now and Calgary were to go conservative, if maybe it might be Calgary experiencing some of those problems two years from now that Edmonton is right now. Could be an interesting story to keep an eye on. I want to wrap the same way with you two that I have with everybody else today. One other observation will bring this full circle back to the federal election. Some writing still in play. What's one story that you're still keeping an eye on that we didn't yet talk about? Something to leave us with that we can make sure that the audience is keen on keeping an eye on that developing story as well. Melissa, you first. What happens to the PPC? Do they just go away? Do they become emboldened by the fact that they were able to increase their vote share by more than three times, even though they didn't win a seat? And how do the conservatives federally work to make sure that they're not dominated by fringe views that are no longer even within the party. Um, I think that'll be very interesting to see what happens. And if Mad Max decides that he's going to continue to stay on, even though he couldn't again win his seat um, in Quebec. Dwayne, how about you? Future of George Shahal, Mm. who is going to be a liberal cabinet minister uh, out of Calgary. He has gone from being a city councillor to sitting around the cabinet table He's got a huge future uh, ahead of him. And so I'm very interested to see what what happens with George Shahal. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I I, I referenced 
Paul Ferry's uh, tweet on the University of Calgary yesterday. He said, congratulations to George Chahal, minister of whatever he wants, uh, which I think is, was a pretty interesting observation. I was paying attention to what both of you had to say yesterday and have been saying over the past month as well. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the show, and we look forward to our next uh, conversation. Dr. Dwayne Brad, a political scientist, uh, steering the ship, quite frankly, over there in that faculty at Mount Royal University in Calgary, and Melissa Cowett, uh, an expert in public policy based out of Vancouver now, principal at MC Consulting. Thank Thanks to the both of you, and we'll chat again soon. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Melissa. You bet. Real talkers, you can let us know what you think. I'd love to ask the question to the audience. And maybe I'll maybe I'll put my colleagues here on the spot, too. Hoyles, you knew it was coming. But don't worry, I'll buy you some time. I'll give you a couple of seconds. This is, I'm really good at this at restaurants. If I can tell that someone I'm sitting with is having a hard time deciding, I can start getting into questions with the server. Where do you source... Where do you source your beef? Tell me a little bit more about this vineyard. And then as soon as I pick up the body language that, you know, you're ready to place your order, then I can quickly pivot out. So don't, don't worry. Uh, but uh, no, I really appreciate that. And, and real talkers in all seriousness, I'd love for you to answer that question too. Uh, hit me up on Twitter at Ryan Jesperson or, or give us a follow. Uh, we're, we're slowly building a pr- pretty decent group over there with our official Real Talk Twitter account at Real Talk RJ. We'd love to know what's a storyline you're following that maybe we didn't pay a lot of attention to this morning. I mean, 338 ridings, you know, a bunch of uh, different leadership scenarios, some ridings still in play, some implications uh, regionally and federally of, of how that election went. What's something that you're paying close attention to? Uh, We certainly appreciate your feedback and your participation in these conversations that we have every single day. The conversations have uh, happened from uh, November 23rd of last year all the way through till today as Real Talk approaches its one year birthday because we've got a team of builders, we call them, our sponsors that back us and make sure that these conversations continue to happen. That includes the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge Jeep. These are the teams that have been providing the best selection when it comes to that Jeep and Dodge branding in the province of Alberta for the num- I mean, the number of years they've been in business, earning the return business of their clients and customers, but it's mattered more now than it ever has in past. If you're trying to get your hands on a, a Dodge Ram right now, I mean, they won't want me to say best of luck, but best of luck, because selection is, is, is suffering With regards to that Suez Canal blockage and the microchips and the manufacturing and COVID and supply chains, it's why it matters even more that Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge Jeep have shared inventories and an amazing inventory of gently pre-owned vehicles. Their used selection is stronger than it has been in a long time, and they're looking to both pick up your used vehicle or help you find what you're looking for. It goes both ways. You can find them online right now. Just look for the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Also, a big shout-out to our friends at Kubi Energy. I don't have to tell you that Positive Reflections happens the first show of every week thanks to our friends at Kubi, who get our week started off on the right foot. You can send us your Positive Reflections to our email inbox, talk at ryanjesperson.com. Kubi is providing solar energy solutions to power your life. Whether it's big, huge installations on milking barns or convention centers or huge industrial installations, big, massive warehouses, or an application maybe out at your cottage, your cabin. Maybe you want to try something modest with your garden suite and grow from there. Kubi's doing jobs big and small with their Tesla certified installers. They're either all of them journeymen or journeyman apprentice installers. That means you can trust the job they're doing, and it's more cost-effective now than it ever has been before. You can enter your inquiry today. They'll get right back to you at kubienergy.ca. Sam Brooks, a storyline you're following. You get to go first. Uh, Do you want something very general or something very specific? Well, you you answer the question however you choose. Okay. Uh, One thing I was really keeping my hand on the pulse of last night as I was watching the results is uh, the two columns for the NDP and the bloc. And I'm kind of saying that because, you know, NDP... A federal party that, that runs a slate of candidates in every single riding is trying to form government, is, is sort of has this national presence, still could not win more seats than the bloc, a regional party just looking out for one province's interest. Huh. And I was watching that seesaw back and forth quite a bit. There was a lot of times when it was tied. Uh, I think that, you know, maybe the NDP really underestimated how much of an effect Quebec has. So that was one thing that I was really, really kind of keeping my hand on the pulse of. Yeah, and some of those writings still in play. Yeah, for sure. So that'll be interesting to see. Mm-hmm. 
a, a more general thing, and I'm I'm lifting this comment actually. Uh, something that Andrew Coyne said last night is he said, you know, if if we look at the last two elections, or actually the last several elections, just as a trend, Canadians have repeatedly elected effectively a coalition of progressives. Yeah. You know, we do give more seats to the Liberals and the NDP than any other party, and that's happened over and over and over again, and that's sort of the direction it's going in. So, big picture, do the Conservatives lean into this, or do they retreat to their base a little bit? I think it was Scott Reed that I'm stealing this from. I can't remember who specifically, but somebody made the observation last night that since 2004, Canadians have held seven elections and sent five minority governments to Ottawa. So five of seven since 2004. Hoyles, what's a what's a storyline that maybe we didn't get to or didn't really sink our teeth into this morning that's really captured your attention? I guess I was just looking at the coverage um, and it being mostly centered out of Eastern Canada mm. or set Upper Canada. Uh, and the idea that, you know, this idea around Alberta and not necessarily getting the nuances, um, which I think is a great place where real talk comes in. Yeah, The idea that, I I heard a lot of quotes about Kenny apologizing and I was like, no, no, that is half the story. Kenny apologized and then said, sorry, not sorry. Yeah. Um, and that was completely missed. Um, and the other piece is, you know, folks giving the criticism around the $600 million price tag on this election. I say well worth it to show that, you know, al although it seems so like little increments of change in Alberta, to your point, there is it's that when the waves are just getting sucked back before there's a yeah, uh, there's there is truly change a coming. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people say that it was worth six hundred and ten million dollars to get Carrie Diod out of Edmonton Greaseba. Like that is something and, that I've uh, just seen all over Twitter. If my math is right, about a month before his federal pension would have kicked in. So that's an interesting one to keep an eye on. And everyone, I've, I've seen multiple people reference that, thank goodness, the ability to actually put in for mayor, like actually the mayor running for the city, closed yesterday in Edmonton. Oh, is that right? So he has no chance oh, of actually Oh, but Dia, Dia would never, uh, he'd never run against his good buddy, Mike Nickel. He, he just wouldn't do it, right? I mean... Uh, but I'm just like, whew, yeah, safety net. Yeah, well, he, and his Diot for Detroit mayoral campaign didn't really work out that well. Don Iveson walked all over that. Uh, there, you'll remember it was Kerry Diot, uh, Karen Leibovici, two former counselors, uh, and Don Iveson in the mix there. And, uh, and and Diot and Leibovici, if I remember correctly, again, off the top of my head, don't quote me, but I think came in around, I think Diot was like, you know, 35,000 or something like that votes. Leibovici, I think, was around 40,000. If I remember correctly, Iveson was, was six digits, you know, 100,000 plus, if I remember correctly. So it, it wasn't necessarily close. Uh, this is not for me. A partisan comment. It's not like, you know, Kerry Diot losing the conservative surrender, Edmonton Griesbois and the NDP come in. For me, it's like Kerry Diot is is just not a good representative of the people. He's not a good representative of the people of Edmonton Griesbois. He's he's been an uninspired and unfocused and in some cases deplorable MP and his, his job performance has, has left many people wanting and I think that Blake Desjardins, um, who is, as I saw yesterday, announced by Dr. Christopher Wells, and I've not fact checked it. So that's why I'm name dropping Wellsy, because I don't want to take the fall if it's not true. But this is reason to celebrate. It, it, it has been announced and it's believed to be uh, Blake Desjardins win the first openly two spirited member of parliament in Canadian history which is really remarkable. And Blake Desjardins ran a really strong campaign. Uh, here's where I didn't bring this up earlier because I didn't really think, it. Uh, you know, I mean, you got to pick and choose what you dig into when you're moderating. And uh, But when Ken Bosenkuhl and, and Max Fawcett joined us earlier today, and Max said, I want to know which of the premier's staff were out east helping with the O'Toole campaign. And I kind of went, yeah, I mean, it, that's kind of a given. Um, I think that, you know, he's referencing Matt Wolf and he's and I and I wonder if they let Brock Harrison back anywhere near the conservative campaign. I'm not sure. Probably. Uh, but that's not unusual. I mean, you look at high profile new Democrats that were knocking on doors for Blake Desjardins, Janice Irwin, um, in my mind, probably the most popular MLA in the province with the most popular cat. Wouldn't you say with oregano? I mean, the fact that I know her fucking cat's name says something. I'm not even a cat guy. Uh, I don't mind cats. They're fine. 
but oregano is is a favorite of this show. This show has a, has a very nonpartisan uh, sort of a, a roster of animals that make regular appearances. Oregano among them. But you know, to my point, and and to get back to the point, uh, I don't think that it's a huge deal nor a huge secret. Um, people can talk about whether or not resources should be allocated in that way and who should pay for it. And should Alberta taxpayers be covering the dime for these guys to go campaign for whatever political party at whatever time? They'll probably tell us that they took vacation to do it, whether or not that's actually true. But I'm not completely bothered by that because I see that one happening with almost every political party. Resources allocated and those lines blurred between provincial and federal uh, areas. But I do think... Um, you look like you're not convinced and jump in if you want to. But I, I, I just I thought that was kind of an interesting one. They certainly poured a ton of resources into Edmonton Greasebaugh. And we've received notes from uh, liberals or small P, small C progressive conservatives from that writing that have told us. And a couple of them, for some reason, were like, please don't read this. I don't really know why you mind, but that's fine. We don't have to have said we voted strategically. I know Stephen Carter from The Strategist told us last Friday, there's no such thing as strategic voting. But in this case. Desjardins wins by about a thousand votes and we've got people chiming in saying I, I've never voted federally for the NDP before but we saw a window here we saw an opening it was important to us that Kerry Diot pack his shit and leave and so they voted for Blake Desjardins I, I just I really feel like yes you can say that De, uh, <laughs> Diot was a terrible terrible candidate but when you looked at the results coming in across the province of Alberta specifically you were seeing that vote split you were seeing huge numbers come in for NDP huge numbers coming in for liberal and it just looking at the differentials seeing if you were able to put those two together you would you would oust the conservative so that to me I mean, Diot was just like <laughs> perfect storm, terrible candidate. If there's a way to actually harness that and shift that around. So I don't know. I, I kind of believed the no strategic voting. And then I was watching the results last night and going. Hur. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, closing thought on the, you know, I, I, Carrie Diot is basically the stock photo you get if you search slimy politician. Oh, geez. And he's replaced by a young, progressive, matey, two-spirit man. And so that's one thing that I think is also just like a real bellwether here is that when you talk about uh, riding shifting or there being a little bit of like a change in the party, a lot of times parties, if they want to unseat, unseat an incumbent, they run somebody that's kind of palatable to what the, the, the electorate is there. And, and the NDP went bold and they won big. And so I think that that's just, you know, if you want to sort of take the temperature of the room, that's a really good indicator. Yeah, we haven't even mentioned her, na her name yet, but we, but we should note that uh, one of the only, or if memory serves me correctly, the only candidate that we had on the show, and it was not because of preferential treatment, it's because we keep track of these types of things. We had partisan conservative voices on, we had partisan liberal voices on, we had partisan green voices on. We did not have partisan PPC voices on the show, for which I will not apologize. Um, but Heather McPherson, out of Edmonton, Strathcona, uh, did join us to provide an NDP perspective. She was walking uh, miles and miles on sidewalks, knocking on doors in a very unique pair of shoes and that was the only orange pair so to speak metaphorically of course in the entire province and for that matter in alberta and saskatchewan and so heather joined us to talk about that unique perspective she won by a relatively wide margin more than ten thousand votes last night at last time i looked anyway uh representing and returning as the member of parliament for edmonton strathcona previously held by linda duncan but conservatives in past uh, including a couple of friends of mine have run in that riding and the, and and the, the the votes have been closer than linda duncan would have liked uh conservatives uh, gave the NDP a real run through a couple of elections, reasonably speaking, in past. That was not the case last night, as the voters of Edmonton and Strathcona spoke in resounding fashion, uh, meaning that Alberta, Edmonton, for that matter, now has two federal seats when it comes to the New Democrats. Coming up on the show tomorrow, you probably saw this uh, online. It was an encouraging story in the sense that people stepped up, but it was brutal. It had to happen in the first place. Why did uh, OBGYN Dr. Stephanie Cooper, who transitioned to the ICU, have to go to social media to source out medical equipment? Plus, the UN calling for a moratorium on AI. Is it really that dangerous? We'll get into it. In the meantime, have a great Tuesday, friends. We'll talk to you soon. The